Jérôme, if you want to, um, I don't know if you, feel free to stop me. Um, so this is an MRG virtual meeting for April. Um, we will start with a brief introduction for the meeting logistic and the agenda, and we will switch after that to the technical presentation. Um, first, a couple of uh, reminding slides about the, the goal of um, the IRTF. So the IRTF conducts research. It is not a standard development organization. Uh, the uh, IRTF focuses on longer-term research issues related to the internet and our, our we say, uh, affiliated or sister uh, organization, the Internet Engineering Task Force, focuses on shorter-term issues of engineering and standards making. We would like to make it clear the distinction between, between both. Um, and IRTF can publish informational and experimental documents in the RFC series. Its primary goal is to promote development of research collaboration and teamwork in exploring research issues related to internet protocols, applications, architecture, and technology. And you can get more information, for instance, in the IRTF primer for IETF participants, RFC 7418, okay? Um, <clears throat> uh, following that, we have also uh, some policies. Uh, the IRTF uh, generally follows IETF policies, and this is uh, the so-called not well. <clears throat> Just as a, a high-level reminder for you that uh, this is a reminder of the IETF policies in effect on various topics, uh, especially regarding uh, intellectual property or code of conduct. Um, so these are uh, important uh, elements uh, we invite you to uh, to be aware of, and especially as a reminder, by participating, if you agree to follow IETF processes and policies, you're aware that any IETF contributions is patent application that are owned or controlled by you or your sponsors must be disclosed. As a participant or attendee to any IETF activity, you acknowledge that written audio, video, and photographic records of meetings may be made public. And for your information, this meeting uh, will be recorded. Uh, personal information that you provide to IETF will be handled in accordance to the IETF, uh, IETF privacy statements. And as participants or attendee, you agree to work respectfully with other participants. And uh, if you're facing any issue, please contact the uh, Ombudsman. And you have a set of other uh, best current practices documents that uh, gives you uh, further guidelines on these IETF policies. Um, now that we are also conducting uh, more virtual meetings, and especially with a uh, series of uh, virtual interims that have been following the uh, IETF 107 that uh, was held fully virtually, uh, there are some kind of um, global uh, etiquette across uh, research group and working group, so we would like to highlight a few points. Please remember that all sessions are being recorded, as it is the case for this meeting. Make sure that your video is off to save bandwidth. Uh, keep yourself muted unless you are speaking. Um, we will handle uh, the queue uh, through the WebEx chat, so if you want to um, make a comment, please type RH uh, in the WebEx uh, chat, uh, to means raising hand, you want to, uh, to say something. And if you want to remove uh, yourself from the queue or not have any more comments, you may uh, type LH uh, and uh, the chairs will handle um, the queue, okay? And when you are speaking, please, uh, for the sake of time, please stay to the point, be concise and precise. I hope everything is clear until now. Uh, a few Links, I think if you're already online, it means that you, you know a bit how to navigate, but this may always be useful. Uh, the agenda materials are available on the IETF data tracker. Uh, you have the etherpad, which is a shared pad. You may have your notes, uh, participants, etc. to the pad. This is also what we will use as a basis for the minutes. Uh, the recording will be made available after the meeting. And please, as I said, please add your name at the bottom of the Ethernet page. Uh, page. Uh, it's very useful to track uh, attendance. Um, overview of our agenda for today. We have a uh, pretty packed agenda, a uh, lot of topics we would like to cover, and especially uh, initially we had planned to have two sessions in the uh, uh, IETF 107 meetings, uh, so we wanted still to be able to, um, uh, to cover most of those topics, so this will be a bit a long uh, meeting today, but we hope you can uh, stay with us until the end. So this is the current first slot, Meeting Logistics Agenda. It will be finished in one minute. And then we will start our technical presentations uh, with uh, Pedro for Intelligent Reasoning on External Events for Network Management. And then uh, Sonia will give us an overview of uh, their work in Telefonica on metadata-based aggregation of telemetry flows. We will have then 
uh, new coming from uh, from Milad on fault tolerance for cervix function change as an introduction of their work. And uh, we see also connections with some other activities in IATF on the uh, SFC. Then um, a new draft coming to the energy uh, with transport slice intents from Luis and Panayotis uh, coming from uh, based on some work in a European project. Um, then automated design of network services from network service requirement um, is a research article, a research work from is also in the scope of uh, IBM uh, work plan. Then we have uh, some draft uh, in energy and in OPS area working group uh, intent classification with uh, Chuyan uh, will give us an update on the current uh, document and some discussion on the, the next steps. We will have Benoit giving us an update on assurance for IBM architecture, which is uh, OPS area working group, but is uh, of course of interest for the IBM. Definition, and finally, if we hope we have still time to give you uh, the main research group updates at the end of this meeting. I hope the agenda is fine for you. If you have any questions or changes, please let us know uh, because it's very packed, and we would like to start uh, right away. Jerome, I don't know if you want to add something, or if we can uh, move on. No, 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 nothing more from my side. Perfect. So. Uh, Pedro, I will uh, project the slides and uh, you just uh, tell me or, uh, when you want to move to the next slide, okay? Uh, okay. Roughly two minutes for presentation and we try to keep uh, time for, for questions for every presentation, okay? Okay, okay can you hear me, is, isn't it? Yes. Okay, so let's go. So I don't see it. Don't see the see the agenda in the screen, on the screen. Now it's, it is changing now. Okay, so as, uh, thank you very much, Laurent, for presenting, uh, for introducing me. Uh, I will just present this uh, update on the on the draft that I'm working on. It's it is called the intelligent reasoning on external events for uh, network management. And uh, uh, please, next, next slide, please. I, I have been working on this uh, together with uh, Homasan from uh, uh, NTT to mainly particularize the, the, the requirements from network slicing for, for especially from this uh, AI in, involvement in network management. So uh, first, the, 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 the quick, context that we have is the AI solutions must work uh, in symphony with other network management solutions. So they allow networks to grow in complexity, deliver faster decisions, etc. So, uh, but, but current uh, machine learning solutions work only on performance data. Normally, the other AI solutions require more information and intelligent reasoning solutions need to collaborate with network uh, uh, to retrieve topology, real time situation, etc and they, uh, 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 they need some uh, uh, special efficient semantic representation and exchange of network data for, for this adoption of uh, in AI in, in network management. Okay, th this is the main context. We have been working on, on research uh, challenges and research topics in, in this overall integration of different not just machine learning but different kinds of machine uh, of uh, artificial intelligence solutions in uh, in network management and especially uh, again I, I insist that we are uh, we have been working together with entity to get requirements from network slicing in order to fulfill this this involvement next slide please so uh, our uh, objective has been now to uh, mainly to gather this information for getting the most benefit of the application of this in, in, in reasoning main, mainly because for now, as we can know, especially from the last uh, ICI conference, we it was very clear that the current status of research on automation and uh, similar tools for the network management is mainly focused on machine learning. So it's not a bad thing, but what I mean is that we have exploited 
the learning phase of uh, intelligence uh, very well. But now we have to move forward. And in the uh, artificial intelligence world, we have the next step, and it was also commented in this uh, latest conference of ICIN, the next step is reasoning. So what is what are the requirements in this sense of from reasoning to exploit the uh, network, uh, uh, sorry, to exploit artificial intelligence in network management. So we aim to define some gaps to this require to this uh, reasoning uh, application and what will be the challenges to integrate reasoning into the network management world. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, I think that we can skip this slide. Uh, please uh, go to the next one, uh, because we have the background. Uh, I will just uh, comment it. Uh, so we have different kinds of, of uh, network uh, systems, that were virtual computers, uh, SDA, etc. And we are also uh, focusing on, on management and slice, uh, slicing. So this is the context is very, very straightforward. And now, I will focus on what will be this application of AI to network management. As I have in, uh, told in previous uh, uh, meetings, I, I, I already I, I introduced, I am working on this concept. And uh, in the latest uh, draft, uh, version of the draft I am working on, we are emphasizing this. So to apply the AI to network management, we need to move beyond machine learning. Machine learning is a very specific uh, uh, tool, and it has very specific way of doing things, like we, uh, it requires one uh, formalization of information in vectors, etc., and some very efficient, or even though it can be computational uh, intensive, but it's very efficient calculations to get some kind of uh, model that after that can be exploited. Okay, but that uh, for now is, uh, uh, it would be very good for answering the question, is there a problem in my system? But now we have more complex questions like, where should I migrate to what this virtual machine to accomplish my goals? Okay, so intelligence is needed for this. And the new function, for example, that answer this question allow network devices to be more autonomic and can be fed to the animal world. Next slide, please. So one key that we are working on on this is to extend management operation to achieve some kind of intelligent network management process. And this, in this sense, we have four, uh, 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 to make the decisions, we have four key points. First will be retrieving the information in, in, in sense of different uh, like performance measurement, but also other kind of information from the databases, external uh, events, etc. This information is fed to current, uh, for example, machine learning tools, and we obtain the model. After that, we also execute the reasoning process. Reasoning processes will infer new knowledge and rules, etc., from this information and models both together. So we have new rules that will be also fed back to the model. So it will be constantly building a better view of the network management uh, from the management point of view. In order to go to this next step, next step will be to solving potential problems. This view will find problems and uh, uh, some specific operation process or, or whatever it's called, uh, will be executed in order to resolve those problems. So this will be the solving part. And finally, once the solution is found, we have to plan that, plan how to implement that solution into the network, how to require the network to adjust the amount of resources that are involved or things like that. So. Uh, 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 these four processes will be executed, and one key point is that they are executed in parallel. So there will be interdependencies, but also some way of independence from them. Uh, 
uh, among them. So it is a very tricky way. So there are challenges, there are uh, uh, interface definitions that we must consider in order to, to make all these processes work together. Okay, we also are being, have been working on the what we call the col closed control loop management approach. That means that once we have these uh, previously mentioned processes, uh, in order to achieve management goals using, using them, we enforce the resulting decisions, and after that, we constantly uh, check that the decisions are being uh, effective. No, so what we do is that we close this control loop. So, uh, in one way or another, these processes I mentioned before, they will be required to connect their outputs to their inputs, but in different kinds of, uh, in different ways. So, some planning will be connected to solving, etc. So, uh, at the end, the objective is that data plane elements will, will be involved also in this reasoning because they must provide some even small information to check that the uh, uh, that the enforced uh, uh, decision is is taken some uh, is being effective so we need that okay uh, next slide please so uh, what we uh, the main uh, the main way no, to execute those uh, processes would be by a, a specific so it's, it's a general swift you know, of the, the, the metaphor of uh, network management. So in this way, exploitation of AI in network management, what we do is that we begin with data and we want to achieve wisdom. So all AI solutions become more like uh, 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 being able to take this kind of strategic decisions by getting data, processing the data, getting information, what is called no? the data formatted in some kind of information. Then from the information we reason, we obtain knowledge and we build what we are familiar, the knowledge base. But with that knowledge, what well, after the application of knowledge, after the exploitation of the knowledge, what we get is that it's a system, it's a wise system. So what we get is wisdom. We are also in the in the draft focusing. Uh, we are also introducing the uh, uh, the achievement of this target, the wisdom, by executing the four processes of AI I mentioned before. We we exploit all the knowledge uh, information or oh, sorry all the knowledge stored in the in the knowledge base in order to achieve a, a system that is more wise so we well, achieve this wisdom okay so that that will be the key of this uh, exploitation part so next slide please that will be the last slide uh, I, I don't know how <laughs> if i am on time or not but i will just finish uh, so, uh, for now, what we are identifying in this uh, draft is that the challenges we are now facing are the reason or network behavior uh, from personal measurements and external events. That's our main uh, uh, challenge uh, we have mainly identified right now in the sense of network slicing, in the, from network slicing part. So uh, the gaps, what we find also identified that would be, we need some method for, for, for allowing different providers and method uh, and vendors be able to co-exit and work together. That means that they can exchange information, they can uh, understand to each other in the terms of this intelligence uh, data. And as I mentioned before, the wisdom of uh, that they uh, obtain from all these uh, processes. So one key point also what we have identified in the draft if, is that we uh, we need some kind of uh, uh, method for the assessment of the quality of the AI. That means that if we have different algorithms, different uh, modules, we can benchmark some way 
access modules, but not just in that sense, benchmarking to uh, to know the performance or something like that. No, just well, I, I am more focusing on assess that they are working as they are expected because one key difference is that today when we be, buy or when we uh, integrate some component, physical or, or, or logical component, they normally we uh, 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 we expect no they work well no we, we are not uh, let's say we we can be deterministic you know in the sense that we know that it will work in some way but when we are introducing some ai module we cannot be deterministic we cannot know we cannot be sure that the module will work so we need some way to assess the quality of the module. That means that the module will work most of the time. That's it. Not just mm, things like uh, MTBF or uh, something like that, but something more uh, uh, focused on the intelligence. Is how smart, how how much is this intelligence of, of this module? Okay. So and and in order to achieve these gaps, to fill these gaps, we have also identified that we need some uh, consistency uh, in, from ontological concepts. So uh, different vendors again on different uh, uh, providers can coexist and understand to each other. So the concepts must be ontologically defined. And finally, what we have identified is that the protocols used to publish the information must respond to some constraint on the target usage. That means that, uh, uh, for example, when we are uh, uh, sharing some data, some information of uh, knowledge items among uh, different providers, different modules, sorry, different modules of, uh, uh, that will analyze that information, we must be sure that in some software or even organizational contract, they will uh, 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 do to the information what we are expecting them to do. Not just in the terms of security or privacy, but in terms of what I mean again is a software contract. No, that the the the, the target model will do what we are uh, uh, expecting it to do. And that's what we have right now. And from now, what we are, uh, our main target uh, by uh, uh, sharing this draft in the uh, NMRG uh, is mainly to ask other contributors from the, uh, in the sense of both structure for the application of AI to network management, but also, uh, of course, in this kind of challenges and gaps for this uh, uh, again uh, uh, for the completion uh, co to achieve more complete spectrum of the uh, of the work that is required to fully exploit the application of ai in network management and that's it okay thank you pedro uh, is this the end of your presentation yes 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 of course okay so um we have uh, i suppose it should be uh, Marie Jose in, uh, acting as Coin Research Group uh, in the chat, uh, raising hands, so maybe she has a question. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, when you go into WebEx and you use whatever account, I'm not here as the CoinRG um, chair. Um, I'm here as a person. Um, okay, I have two questions, comments. One, I think it's interesting that you didn't mention data sets here. You talk about ontology. But it's more than that. It's the data set. What are the data that you're going to use for what you call network management? And they should be problem specific. There's a ton of things that happen in a network that are completely disconnected. So what do you mean by having this very generic reasoning? The other one, you seem to be kind of confused about the role of machine learning. Machine learning is just not just accumulate data for in comma learning, it's also to infer on that learning, what you call the AI part. So 
um, again, if you have a good data set and you actually have your machine learning, then your system becomes by itself autonomous. And, and, and so, and when you say that you, you, um, um, you need to know if the information is right or not, well, that's actually what machine learning is designed to do throughout the machine learning process, either by automatic, uh, decision making or by annotating by experts. So, you know, while you train your algorithm, you can have inputs from experts who say, well, this is the behavior that we. Uh, we expect, so you have your training set. So I think you're, what I see is that yeah, there's a lot of good stuff in there, but there's a lot of things that seem to be incomplete or mixed up. So do you intend in your um, next version of your draft to uh, make this more clear? Because right now um, it's too vague. What is the problem you're trying to solve? That's uh, uh, I'm sorry. What, what, for now, we are not focusing in just one problem, but uh, again, I insist to gather these kind of challenges. Okay, I understand your uh, your your points. Um, what I'm I am more uh, in this sense. Maybe it's not so clear the difference that we are uh, trying to clarify here, etc. In the sense of uh, uh, the, this particular difference between the learning phase, not just I am not saying that machine learning only gathers information. Machine learning is what it has. It builds a model from the information that we ha we have. It builds a model of knowledge. It's okay, but it, it, the inference that machine learning has is just for the output of this information. What we want is to go beyond that inference, to do reasoning on that inference. Let's say, not just learning and, and stop there, but uh, build the model, okay, but dynamically change the model. In order to do that, we must establish new rules and new ways uh, to do that. So the idea is that uh, after machine learning process has finished, okay, we can take decisions with the output, but what uh, 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 the next step would be those decisions, those outputs from machine learning would be reasoning uh, uh, beyond that output in order to obtain meta information, let's say information about the machine learning tool and uh, 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 let's say change that tool with new rules and new conditions, et cetera, that the reasoning uh, operation is uh, uh, doing in that sense. After that, we again, I insist that we have the planning, et cetera, but it, it will be beyond. But the main point right now, the, the, sorry, main, the next step right now would be to exploit the, this reasoning part. And we want to clarify that. So, if you want, for example, uh, co collaborate in this draft in order to clarify the point, the, 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 the involvement of machine learning in all this process, we are open to new collaborators. We, we, it's our target right now. We are not focusing in, in specific problems, but to, in order, uh, we are more. A uh, uh, wide spectrum to define the challenges and gaps and find collaborators that can uh, provide this kind of, of uh, uh, details that we are missing in the draft. Okay. Okay. Um, so thanks, uh, Marie Jose, for raising your, your points and thanks for Pedro trying to, to address them. We are a bit tight on schedule. So uh, yeah, my, my recommendation, and because I think this is good discussion and we, is to follow up with your with your draft, maybe with uh, addressing uh, on the mailing list uh, the, the comments raised by Marie Jose, trying to develop further um, what could be uh, your your common understanding on that. As you will see later, Jerome will present. Also, we have uh, we are introducing a new uh, documents on research challenges for AI in network management. I believe that some of your uh, inputs could really go to these documents also to uh, to um, to contribute to these other documents. And as we have seen, it would be nice also if you can try to to I would say develop a bit further 
the next step for your documents and, 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 and going from this, I will say, more high level views about more concrete proposals, uh, how we can uh, I mean, develop this further in the NMRG or elsewhere, but at least from your initial uh, vision, uh, what can be the, the, the next steps. Okay. Okay, uh, final remark, but this we can also work offline as uh, properly raised in the chat. I mean, we see that you have a confidential tag uh, in uh, all of the slides. Just removing it, I'm sorry. It was yeah, yeah, we, 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 uh, we, draw, we have not seen that uh, when we uh, accepted the slides, but I think it will be better if you can send us a revised version without this uh, confidential. Right. I'm just changing it right now. I will send them. Uh, okay. will, yeah. No worries, it's okay, it's fine. Thanks, thanks, Pedro. Okay, so thank you. Let, give me time to switch to the next presentation, which I think will be Sonia. Just we are running already a bit late uh, with respect to our planning, so I will ask our presenters to to really try to be uh, uh, to, to to their time and also for for the questions. Of the, uh, Can you see the slide? Uh, no. Uh, no. I can no, see. I can see. Yeah, now I can see it. Okay. Okay. So good afternoon. Uh, my name is Sonia, and I'm working in the transport and IP network division in the Global CTIO unit in Telefonica Research and Development. So a bit uh, intro introducing myself, uh, during the last two years, I've been working in different European projects regarding new telemetry mechanisms for network devices in 5G networks. So in relation with this, uh, now we are exploring about a metadata-based aggregation of telemetry flows, which is the main topic of this presentation. Next slide, please. Uh, so for this presentation, uh, we are going through a short introduction followed by the description of the standard in which we base our initial work. And then uh, we will see the initial report of our work. And finally, we will state some conclusions and the request for this research group. Next. And next one, please. As you already know, uh, over the years, telecommunication networks have evolved in order to address the, the demand of the new services. So the increasing number of nodes uh, that forms the, the networks and their advanced capabilities, the evolution of the underlying technologies and all the different ways to access the network has turned uh, telecommunication networks uh, into a very heterogeneous networks, not only regarding the technologies, but also uh, traffic requirements from the provision of different services. So this situation uh, raised a new way in the network management in which the data is the key element for handling these heterogeneous networks. Uh, next, please. In these uh, data-oriented networks in which it's necessary to handle the heterogeneity of all of these uh, components, it's important to offer uh, data in a consistent way to all of the different service applications needed for the closed-loop automation systems, such as some application uh, about artificial intelligence or big data or whatever. So for this work, uh, we propose the use of a semantic uh, metadata framework for aggregation of all of the data coming from the network. Next. So uh, this semantic uh, metadata framework is based on on the idea of using a model to describe the different network elements that are present in a data flow. This uh, metadata will not be used for sending the data itself, but it models the data that the device is capable of providing. So by using this semantic metadata framework, uh, the different data sources or flows will be described by means of this metadata, and it would then be necessary to adapt all of the control elements one by one. So um, apart from this, uh, the application of this semantic model will imply some changes in the current definition of the descriptors, but uh, as we are in a very early stage, we are not focusing in this part yet. Next. So for the starting point of this idea of defining a 
data framework is based on, on the Etsy standard uh, called context information management. So I'm going to introduce you a little bit of this uh, concept. This standard uh, defines an API for context information management, enable access uh, to the information coming from many different uh, sources. So for implementing this, uh, the standard provides an information model that defines the structure of context information that must be supported by the system. Initially, uh, it was thought for IoT data sources, but the scope is not tied uh, for these uh, data sources. So uh, this uh, standard allows users to provide, consume, and subscribe to context information in different scenarios. Uh, next one, please. So uh, besides uh, the SIM standard does not define a specific uh, architecture for implementing this system, they provide some recommendations about three possible architectures, uh, a centralized, a distributed, and a federated uh, architecture. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the three architectures uh, have the same key components that are the ones that you can see here, which are the context consumer, that is basically the application that needs this context information uh, of the data sources for requesting one information or another, uh, the ones that fits for the uh, application. Then uh, it is the context producer or context sources, uh, which corresponds with all the data sources that produce some data, and thus they need uh, the definition of this context data. Then there is a, a central piece, uh, which is the, the, main, the main one, which is the broker, uh, is responsible for handling uh, the request uh, from the consumers, the application, and asking the information uh, to the source. And finally, uh, depending on the, on the architecture that you choose, there is another component, which is the contest registry, which is a component that uh, can be in the broker or can be in a separate one, in which uh, basically the data source register uh, the context information they can provide and is available to be requested by the broker for the uh, corresponding request uh, done by the <laughs> consumers. Uh, next one. So as you can see here, uh, this is uh, the proposal that uh, is in the standard for a distributed architecture. As you can see, all the interactions between the consumers and the source are done through a broker who requests the context information of the data sources uh, to the context registry. Uh, and the context source uh, previously uh, were registered in the context registry. Next one. So, as I said before, uh, this standard provides an information model uh, that defines the structure of the context information that should be supported by the system that I uh, shown in the previous slide. So, this information model relies on the idea of having an ontology, which basically provides the definition of a set of concepts, their taxonomy, and the relationship that governs these concepts. So this figure shown a, a UML representation of the information model defined in the standard, which is composed by different entities, relationships, and properties. Uh, next one. So now, uh, once uh, the base for this work uh, is present, uh, we are going to, uh, to see the initial steps we went through for applying this to the telemetry metadata. Next one. So uh, one of the final goals uh, we have um, for implementing this work is trying to build a generic patterns for metadata definition. However, until reaching these general patterns, we start first collecting multiple uh, context source uh, that we will have available in different scenarios and an initial static definition of some information models for this uh, context source that we identify. So at the same time, uh, we are defining um, all of these information models. Uh, we would like to start building a, a semantic aggregator or the broker at, at, uh, at this is called in the SIM standard by making use of tools already available in the industry uh, for making preprocessing uh, of the data and the interaction for the different modules of this architecture. And finally, uh, all of this work is 
trying to be aligned with uh, the SIM standard as much as possible as we take it as a reference. Next one. Apart uh, from, from that, uh, we start to think how can we integrate uh, this semantic framework into a general and a common architecture using the current projects uh, that we are working on. So as you can see here, uh, we add the semantic aggregator plus the context registry in, uh, in two possible domains, the network service provider domain and the local one. These two domains uh, will be able to interwork also uh, in the in, in this uh, level and by doing this all the elements available and allowed by the network service provider can be used by the local semantic aggregator to be requested by the local service application such as artificial intelligence, some monitoring platform or whatever application it's need in the local domain. Next one. So here uh, you can see some of the data source uh, we have already identified uh, in the projects that we are working. So some of them are network-based profs such as an ICMP prof, HTTP, DNS, IPFIX, uh, and so on. And uh, we are also considering uh, devices that already defines the information through a young model, uh, and for example, data located in some uh, time series database. Next one. So uh, starting from uh, in the next two slides, uh, you will see uh, some examples uh, of the information model we start to define for some of the context source uh, that uh, I, I shown before. So in this case, in this slide, uh, this corresponds to the information model for a network-based prof such as an ICM ICMP prof. So as you can see, uh, it follows the SIM standard in which the information model is composed of different entities, the, the, um, the white boxes, um, properties, uh, and some relationships between uh, these entities. So apart from the specific things of this context source, uh, the ICMP prof, this information model implements two important characteristics. The first one, uh, how is the information structure of this ICMP prof by the definition of the schema property, as you can see with the JARM uh, dictionary. And the second property uh, will be how this semantic aggregator, the broker, can reach this ICMP prof by the definition of the entity endpoint characterized by the entity uh, URI. Next one, please. So the, the second, the second um, example will be um, for a young base device. So we are still defining this information model and it could be sound a little repetitive because the young data models have already defined the structure of the information a network device can provide. But uh, the idea of the semantic aggregator is trying to unify all the possible data source needed and not all of uh, these data source implements young data models. For this reason, uh, we thought that it would be good to take advantage of the already defined young models in the device for inferring the properties for this entity device that owns uh, multiple entities of young model. Uh, next one. Uh, next one, please, yeah, is the last, last slide. So as a summary, uh, we have been uh, seeing that the data-driven network management requires the aggregation of the heterogeneous uh, sources of data um, that we have to, uh, do, uh, to the different services that are provided and all of the devices that conform the, the networks. Uh, also, as we have previously commented, uh, we aim uh, to extend existing uh, metadata model for IoT environment to the uh, network management uh, environment. And finally, uh, we would like to kindly ask you if you are interested in this work and if so, trying to document it in an ID. Uh, so this is a very early stage of the work. So uh, this is all from my side. We are happy to... to uh, hear from you anything you want to ask. Thank you very much, Sonia, for being uh, also very uh, on time.
uh, unless I'm mistaken, I have not seen um, people raising hand to comments. I have uh, uh, one question, but uh, I would like to give the floor to others first. Okay, if not, um, I understood from, from what you say about this aggregator that uh, somehow this will be a kind of um, this contextual, uh, I mean, the patterns that you describe or the, the mm -hmm. will, will be a bit like bottom up. I mean, it will be like organic. I mean, you will be observing what's going up from the network in terms of telemetry. And out of that, try to build a more um, uh, aggregated model of uh, our patterns. This is a correct understanding? Uh, no, the idea, uh, if I understood you correct, uh, the idea is more than uh, you have a module in your system that uh, all the sources that you have available, you can register uh, once you know it. And uh, then this module can sh uh, send to the application needed uh, by your system this information. For example, you have uh, these three uh, data sources and the information that uh, they can provide to you is this uh, information, this information, and this information. So by doing this, the application can select which is the information uh, that really needs for, uh, for working properly. Okay, yeah, thanks for the explanation. Uh, I've seen also that in the chat there have been uh, <clears throat> several comments and exchange uh, on different aspects. So we will try to capture that also in the in the minutes of the meeting. And also from, from your last point about the interest from the research group and mm -hmm. uh, re relaying Benoit's comments, uh, yes, please document it. Even though I would prefer data model instead of an information model. And data <laughs> models provide APIs anyway, data model versus IM is non debate. So I think. Uh, at least personally, not as a chair, and uh, I think from what I saw in the chat, they, they, there are some interest today to, uh, to move further with this uh, proposal, and it would be nice to, uh, to get a bit more, I would say, uh, materials to read from you. I think it could uh, really benefit to other items we have in the research group uh, on uh, either the, the, the realm on, um, uh, on AI-related or even maybe what Pedro just mentioned with its needs for ontologies and semantic aspects of, uh, of data. I think this could be benefiting a discussion in the research group. So yes, we will gladly be uh, reading more from you uh, on this topic. Okay, thank you. Uh, Pedro, you want to raise hand? Pedro? If you're trying to talk, Pedro, we cannot hear you. Is your mute? Now, can you hear me now? It's okay now. Yeah, in fact, what uh, I, I just wanted to point that uh, uh, the CIM model can be uh, a good way to, let's say, implement the ontology that I was mentioning before. I was uh, a few years ago, I worked with CIM and it is quite uh, complete, complete for this uh, task. So we can collaborate in these uh, uh, two topics together to put them together in the same place. Let's say the relation between the AI application and the CIM model for the uh, uh, for this information retrieval, etc. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Let's let's talk in the future, <laughs> please. Okay. Okay. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, you also to time constraints. We will like uh, Cut the line now and switch to the next presentation. So I think the next one is uh, Milad. Uh, let me just uh, switch to the right uh, slide set. You want to be able to present yourself, Milad? It's okay for me. Uh, is that possible that I present myself? Possible, uh, but sometimes just for ending smoothly the transition, it's better if we uh, do the slide. But if you have this, you can, uh, I can uh, project and is, you can. Uh... Yeah. The other thing is, like, you know, I sent uh, the latest version last night uh, and uh, I sent you uh, the, the latest version right now. Would it be possible? Uh, so it's not that much different, but if I uh, could present the latest version, that would be, uh, that would be great. Um, but if it's not possible, that's uh, totally fine. 
Yeah, I apologize. Maybe just for the sake of time, because we're already running a bit late. Yeah, of course. The difference is not so critical. It will be better if we can um, handle it uh, with the current version. Sure. Okay. Um, so you have you have the control. You can click to to go to the next slide. Okay. Sure. Perfect. Uh, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Milad. I'm from University of Waterloo, and I present uh, fault tolerance service function cleaning. It's a uh, joint work between me and my colleagues. Uh, uh, Jalalpur, Professor Bert Wong, Professor Ali Mashtizade, and Professor Ralph Gutaba. Uh, so, uh, in this presentation, I will talk about fault tolerance service function chaining. And the idea is that how we can keep a service function chain running after f number of its service functions uh, fail. And uh, I will talk about how we can integrate. Uh, FTC, fault tolerance uh, chaining, with NSH to provide a fault tolerance for industry. Uh, here's the outline of my presentation. Uh, service functions or middle boxes are network function that uh, receive the traffic, process the traffic, and uh, forward the traffic. Uh, uh, here are two examples. For example, on the left side, you see uh, uh, network address translators, and uh, they act as a bridge between a private network and public network. For example, uh, in, uh, in this figure, Alice and Bob are residing in the private network. They send the traffic uh, and they use uh, private IP addresses, and the NAT translates these private IP addresses to public IP addresses that are accessible uh, in, uh, in the internet. And uh, change the header of the packets that uh, it receives from Alice and Bob to public IP addresses and send the packet to the internet. Uh, in return, when it receives the packets back, it can uh, uh, replace the header with the private addresses and send it to correct address. Uh, on right side, uh, there is another example firewall that receives uh, packets and filter them based on some rules. For example, it receives blue and red packets, and based on the rules, it only allows blue packets to pass. Um, service functions uh, fail, uh, and their failing uh, could be damaging. 43% of high severity incidents in uh, data centers networks are due to failure of middle boxes. Even major players like Google and Amazon also has, uh, have suffered from the failure of middle boxes. Uh, the, to combat this issue, there are fault turns uh, approaches and, and the main idea behind fault tolerance approaches is that we only need to uh, replicate the state of that particular service function. For example, in this example, to make uh, and uh, to make NAT uh, fault tolerant, we only we need to replicate its connection state. It uses this connection state to remember who is talking to uh, whom. So, for example, in here. It, uh, the NAT remembers that Alice is talking to Apple, Bob is talking to Bing, and based on these connection states, it can translate the uh, packets back and forth between private IP addresses and public IP addresses. So to make that fault tolerant, we have a replica, a NAT replica, that exactly replicates uh, that connection state, so that if the original NAT fails, and if we lose the original uh, NAT connection state, we still have a replica of that. And the only thing that we need to do is redirect the traffic to the uh, secondary NAT. But actually, the devil is in details, and uh, there are uh, uh, main work that describe how we can achieve this replication. And they mainly focus on uh, single middle boxes, single service functions, and they are a snapshot based system. By snapshot, I mean that they frequently uh, take the snapshot of the 
service, fun service function state and replicate it into some uh, separate replicas so that if uh, the primary fails, we have the replica, uh, 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 a snapshot of the state in some other place in the network. Uh, our work is to make a service function chain fall turns. And uh, we, uh, to the best of our knowledge, we are first to address this problem. But uh, why do we, why is that different from have one, uh, but then it is different from making individual middle boxes, individual service functions, uh, fall turns. Uh, it turns out if we use existing system, existing snapshot based system, uh, for a chain of service function, the throughput uh, drop is uh, massive. Uh, on left side, you see that if uh, we have a chain of five middle boxes, five service functions, we almost lose half of the throughput because of the snapshots. The reason that we lose that much of uh, uh, throughput is that uh, I, when one of uh, service function is taking a snapshot, it has to pause its operation. But by pausing its uh, operation, the entire chain stop. And with longer chains, we have more uh, pause time and no, more no service time. And that's why we have a lot of throughput overhead. Our approach is different. We don't do a snapshot base and we make the entire chain fall turned. The key here, the key difference is that we use the chain itself to make uh, a service function chain fall turned. But how do we do that? Uh, I'm not going to uh, go to uh, in the interest of time to all the details about our system, but uh, I will talk about two uh, aspects of our system, a state piggybacking and in-chain replication. Uh, if you don't mind, I first talk about in-chain replication and then I come back to uh, state piggybacking. So, uh, as I, uh, I as I mentioned before, in existing approach to uh, to provide fault tolerance for a service function, what we need uh, is that we replicate the state of service function in some uh, separate replicas across the network. We wait for their acknowledgement, and then at that time we can release any packet that has modified the state. But in our system, we uh, use the chain itself to make the chain fall turn. We observe that already traffic goes through the chain from service function one, to service function two, to service function three, for example. So why not we use the next, uh, the subsequent service functions in the chain as the replica for uh, the, for example, uh, first service function. In this uh, example, for example, we can use service function two as a replica of service function one. When we combine, when we combine uh, in-chain replication with state piggybacking, and by state piggybacking, I mean that existing approach, uh, each uh, we observe two uh, uh, tra uh, traffic uh, streams coming out of each service function. One is the data traffic, the normal traffic that they process, and the other traffic stream is to disseminate, uh, is to disseminate the state updates to replicas for a state replication. In our approach, uh, instead of doing that, whatever uh, state has been changed to processing a packet, we piggyback that onto the packet itself and there is only one uh, traffic stream going to uh, 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 coming out of a service function. Combining a state piggybacking and uh, in-chain replication gives us uh, uh, a system that can achieve high performance. Uh, so let's let's uh, see uh, let's see in more details how our system works. 
So let's say that uh, we want to provide fault turns for two service function, SF1 and SF2, and they're running in separate servers. To tolerate one failure, we instantiate three replicas, R1, R2, and R3, and they are uh, re, uh, they're located in separate servers in order to uh, isolate their uh, failures so that if one of them fail, its failure is independent of the others. It doesn't cause the failure in other replicas. In, the, uh, in here, uh, uh, the state of uh, ser first service function is replicated by R1 and R2, and the state uh, of uh, the second service function is replicated by uh, R2 and R3. Replica also intercepts packets, and they provide a state management API for uh, service function so that they can trace and they can track whatever the state has been changed by service function so that they can replicate it and send it to the to next replica. Uh, as I mentioned before, whatever state has been changed uh, by processing a packet, our system piggyback that onto the packet. So for example, in here, uh, when the first packet uh, comes to our system, the first uh, replica send it to the ser first service function and tracks whatever state uh, has been changed due to processing that packet. And when the service function releases the packet, the first replica uh, piggyback the state changes due to processing that packet onto that packet and uh, releases the packet to the next replica in the chain. Uh, R2 receives that packet replicates the state, uh, detaches the uh, piggyback the state, send it to the service function, track whatever state could be changed by processing that packet, and when service function two sends the packet out, it receives the packet, piggyback uh, state changes into the packet, and send it to the uh, third replica. And R3 even receives the packet, it replicates uh, the state, piggyback the state, uh, strip that piggyback state from the packet, and then finally release uh, the original packet to the outside world. Uh, by doing so, uh, basically we achieve uh, high performance. And here is one of the results that we achieved by running our system. We compared our system with uh, non-fault tolerant a service uh, uh, with non fault tolerant service function chain, which uh, is basically the baseline, the highest uh, performance that we can achieve. And we compare it with the state of art FTMB. Uh, you see two uh, labels for FTMB, FTMB pl uh, and FTMB plus a snapshot. You can ignore FTMB. Uh, FTMB plus a snapshot is actually the actual system. And as you can see, for a chain length, uh, uh, for different chain length, we uh, achieve almost twice as the uh, state, state of the art. And for the chain length of five, uh, we uh, achieve 3.5 times higher throughput. We believe that uh, FTC could uh, provide a good platform uh, uh, for fault tolerance of service functions and service function chains. And combined with NSH, uh, we believe that uh, we can provide a great platforms that is supported by, uh, because NSH, uh, which is a, a protocol uh, designed by IETF, uh, is already supported by industry. And we think that by combining NSH with FTC, we can provide a great platform for uh, fault tolerant uh, service functions. Uh, let's delve into uh, the details of NSH. So, uh, network service header or NSH has been defined in RFC 8300. Uh, yeah. Mila, just sorry to interrupt, but I think we are uh, approaching to the end of your presentation time and we are all a bit late. So, if you have slides that you can maybe accelerate a bit upon, this will be nice. Uh, sure. So yeah, it would be like one or two minutes. 
Okay, thanks. Yeah, sure. Um, so we have, a, a, and a NSH has uh, three main component, service function for warrior, service function, which is uh, as before, and NSH packets. Uh, service function for warrior can implement uh, a replica. And the task that it does is basically, uh, I cannot, um, oh yeah, okay, uh, it's working. So uh, SFF uh, can replicate, uh, can uh, implement uh, our replica. Currently, NSH supports packet forwarding through chain, uh, but our contribution and our ongoing work is extending NSH for uh, extending a service function for order to uh, uh, provide also a state management API and a state replication. And we add the uh, support of NSH into click modular router. Uh, we also uh, uh, working on supporting uh, NSH, uh, using NSH header to uh, piggyback a state. NSH header, um, so here we see the NSH header and there are lots of fields here, but uh, the only thing that I want to focus here is variable length context header, which is the variable uh, which allows uh, us to uh, carry, uh, which allows us to uh, carry metadata uh, inside the service function chain. And we can use that to, to piggyback the state. Uh, I passed this one in the interest of time. Uh, currently, NSH uh, provides packet encapsulation and variable uh, length of the data. But our contribution is uh, we define how we can use an assessment of the data uh, to, uh, to piggyback a state. And because there is, these information are uh, se uh, sensitive information about the network, we also need to devise uh, secure approaches uh, that maintains the confidentiality of the data. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, uh, that was my. Uh, Presentation. Thanks, Milad, for, for being straight to the point. Uh, any comments from people? Uh, okay, Jerome? Yes, <coughs> thank you, Milad, for your presentation. Uh, um, I know we have already had some talk, but can you give me, because I think it's very interesting the idea of the piggybacking uh, of the states. Uh, but uh, what, what is a uh, because you want to put in some uh, in the NSH, what we can expect in terms of size that we need here to piggyback states for, for I mean for certain service if you have some example in mind. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So for example, uh, one of uh, so uh, uh, in our system we work we implemented NAT. For NAT, usually one packet may cause. Uh, uh, adding some information into connection state, which is around 40 bytes. Um, so uh, load balancer also, uh, stateful load balancer, they are around the same uh, size, around like, you know, 40 to 60 bytes. So lots of, uh, you know, lots of uh, middle boxes, lots of service function, we expect that one packet shouldn't go beyond uh, a few dozen uh, bytes. And we think that NSH should be enough, NSH header should be enough to carry the state of one. But that's uh, the, the question that you ask is very interesting because for longer chains, when we have more service function and when we want to support higher uh, failure, um, uh, uh, so for example, let's say that we want to support five failures. So we need to, uh, packet needs to carry the state of six uh, middle boxes, six service functions. For those cases, it could be challenging because it could go uh, grow uh, too much. So there is a probably there is a limitation there that we cannot go beyond some uh, um, some number of failures or beyond some size of uh, service function chain actually function chain. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks. Milad. I also raised a question on the chat, so maybe just for the sake of time, it's not need to, to to process it now, but maybe offline by email or whatever we can uh, sure. discuss further about this. I think this is some also work you plan to uh, probably uh, propose towards uh, SFC working group. Uh, yeah, but yeah, uh, that would be uh, our intention. Yeah. 
Okay. Okay. So we will hear from you uh, again, probably. <laughs> Thanks, Mila. Sorry for being a bit, uh, I mean, uh, abrupt because we are a lot of presentation and we'd like to, to take time to, to go through all of them. But of course, we can continue to discuss offline, let's say, on the mailing list or even uh, direct uh, emails. Thanks. Thank you very much. So let me just check what we have next on the agenda. Um, so now we are switching a bit more towards the uh, um, intent based networking uh, aspect of the research group activities. And the next one will be uh, Luis for the transport slides uh, intent. Yeah, hello. Give me just time uh, switch to the slide. By the way, can you hear me well? Okay. Okay, I'm showing your slides. Please let me know when they are up. Okay, I can see them now. Yeah. Okay, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Um, could you enter the presentation mode? Because some of them are animated, but basically one of them, just to, to be sure that the animation sure. run. Okay, thank you. So yeah, here we will present the, um, uh, the, the slice intent approach that uh, well, uh, we have as, uh, starting to document it in, uh, that you can see the reference. Uh, this is a joint work between Telefonica and Wings. And this has been initiated in the framework of uh, one of these European projects, uh, the 5G EVE. And so we will provide details in the following slides. So next slide, please. Okay, so the background for this work is basically we have started to explore these ideas of intent based mechanisms, uh, but applied to the network slicing concept. This, in fact, was already presented in the presentation that I referred there in the slides in the Singapore meeting. At, uh, at that time, uh, the, the work was basically focused on the uh, location and inst instantiation and placement of, of different BNFs in, uh, in some test facilities and so. And even though these BNFs are finally connected, there was not an emphasis on the transport uh, slicing itself. Uh, taking into account that uh, there is some initiative in, um, in the TIS uh, working group, now work, uh, we are, uh, there is a of people working in a, on a design team, this is also my case, which is uh, actually focused on, on transfer slicing. So we uh, try to zoom in these ideas of um, being carried out in the 5G project, focused uh, specifically on the transport part, so to see how we could apply basically this for um, requesting and instantiating transport slices. Next slide, please. So, um, regarding uh, this initiative in, in the TIS working group, uh, there are uh, actually or currently two outcomes. Uh, one transport slice uh, definition draft and another uh, de uh, describing the framework for this transport slicing. But if, if we look at the, the first case and the transport slice definition, um, it is mentioned there that basically what is expected by the tran potential transport slice controller would be a way uh, in the northbound interface, I mean, to be a way of expressing the need of connectivity in a technology agnostic way. So basically, we would not require at that stage in the, in the northbound part uh, to recognize any kind of concrete configuration. So we could expect there a more declarative than imperative way of requesting the slices. So the, the request, uh, just put in the last uh, sentence in, in the paragraph. So the request to instantiate the transfer slice is represented with some indicators such as uh, service level objectives. So no technologies are selected, and later on the technologies will be selected and managed accordingly once this is more or less uh, processed. Okay. So we, looking at this, we we thought that the intent based approach could be adequate for the provision of these transfer level slices. So as far as we could uh, provide. Uh, appropriate level of abstraction, uh, we could manage. Uh, we think that we could manage this transport slice request uh, with these intent-based mechanisms. And this is what basically we are exploring in this draft. Next slide, please. Okay. So the, the um, for for exploring that, we look at the at the 
case of the 5G services, which are basically the ones that will uh, firstly require, require from the network operators the capability of instantiating a network slices. In this sense, in the, in the 3GPP, or the 3GPP defines a, a way of uh, instantiating and requesting these slices into N. So you can see in the, in the figure, basically, it is, it is expected to have a 3GPP management system that, that could uh, manage it or control or instantiate it. The slices in the, in the RAM part, in the radio access part, in the core network part, but also instruct uh, the transport network uh, management system to instantiate some slices and to connect uh, the different slice parts that or slice instances that could be deployed end to end. So basically, here we are focusing on the yellow boxes. So the, the transport network management system will be the one receiving uh, the, the, the request for deploying the, the transport slice in the underlying uh, supporting transport capabilities, either optics, IP, or whatever. So we will be here basically trying to address the, the interface between this 3G PP management system and the transport network management system. For the interface, uh, I mean the, how to apply the interface mechanisms on this relationship between both uh, management systems. Next slide, please. Uh, looking at the concept definitions draft in, in LMRG, basically uh, intent is defined as a high-level uh, declarative goal to define outcomes and high-level operational goals. Um, related to the to the 3GPP, to the 5G uh, slice services and so, there is an initiative in GSMA uh, where basically they are defining a generic slice template in order to allow uh, users of the of the network, in this case vertical customers, or, or who uh, specify the, the different kind of attributes in order to uh, deploy this uh, slice end to end. And uh, for those attributes, you can you can consider things like, for instance, the the speed of the of the terminals or the location or whatever. But also there are some other attributes that are related to the transport part themselves, uh, like the bandwidth, like the latency, and, and so on and so far. So um, basically what we uh, were looking at is that probably this generic slice template could be a very good foundation for this transfer slice intents in the sense that uh, there would be a way of expressing uh, attributes that uh, the customer uh, complete could fill out uh, in order to request the, the, um, uh, the, the properties of the slice to, to be accomplished in the transport part. Um, next slide, please. Yeah. So then looking at the, uh, the intent life cycle uh, that is being defined in this uh, concept definition draft from NMRG uh, for the intent-based systems, uh, basically uh, we see that there uh, could be uh, um, yeah, applicability of this generic slice template concept and um, can you click please in the slide because this is animated just to okay so uh, here we foresee, we do foresee that uh, at this point there would be some processing of the generic slice template at least in, in the transport concerns in such a way that um, when the customer re uh, request and feel you take control. Thank you. Uh, when the customer, the, the vertical user, uh, fill and request the, the transport slice, then there will be a, a process by the intent-based system in order to understand and, and to process the, the information of this uh, slice template and then apply them to the. Uh, okay, how, I'm not sure. Okay, to the. Sorry to the uh, configuration of the network. So we will have uh, somehow two processes here. So the, the um, uh, processing and the understanding of the, uh, the slice template attributes that could come from the generic slice template. And another process basically for instructing the network, the network in this way, uh, the transport slice controller, um, once these uh, parameters has been processed and, and the, 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 let's say that the request has been uh, completely characterized. So we could expect at this level to manage the um, attributes like the ones in the generic slice template. And as this is at this other okay, at this other stage, we could expect to um, sorry. Ah, okay. 
okay, to interact with the transport lights controller through the northbound interface. And here we reference another work that we're, where we are trying to identify parameters that could be part of this northbound interface in the transport lights controller. So, um, moving forward, let's see. If, okay. So regarding the mechanisms for translating the transport lights intents, so it's, it's clear on our know, understanding is clear that we need uh, a well-defined uh, context aware attributes to, should, to be agreed upon. Uh, sorry, apologies for, <laughs> okay. So with this uh, context aware attributes, there will be an unambiguous uh, way of uh, instantiating the, the transport lights through these intent driven uh, mechanisms. And uh, this uh, attribute will be basically a combination of a, of a structured set of attributes that somehow could be communicated in an intent-based system on the upper layer system, the 3GPP in the example of IG, but could be other examples, the other use cases, okay? Together with user input uh, attributes that in such a way that we can uh, complete all the intent uh, base for the transport slice, and the, the intent-based system could check completeness and validity of the request and so on. Well, in translation approaches, uh, what we are um, investigating now is basically the, the benefit of the na natural language processing techniques. So we are considering that this was also done in the initial work in the, um, when we were referred to the uh, network slices end to end. So we think that this uh, natural language processing techniques uh, could enable make it ways, let's say, of, of enabling this high level expression of requirements to be uh, missed and probably in, a, in an initial pass for once the attributes in the generic slash template are um, offered from the upper uh, system. And also we, cons we, we will consider uh, the support of artificial intelligence and machine learning mechanisms in order to uh, support, let's say, the translation mechanisms and to make this learning process um, once we start running uh, transport slices in the system. So this is uh, intended work to, to be developed in, in the framework of this uh, draft. So going to the very last slide, I think. If this reacts. Okay, so as next steps, so we will keep working on, on this, basically with these ideas of the natural language processing and so. Also, we we will continue working on analyzing the attributes that are coming from the generic slice templates from domain, but also others that are coming from the from the industry and also from other use cases that could be the interconnection of uh, NFB environments or uh, network sharing situations or uh, evolution of wholesale services and so. We, we want to keep uh, this uh, work aligned with the progress in this uh, network slicing design team. Trying to basically to complement the work being done there, and uh, here we we would like to basically request comments from uh, from the audience, from the group, from the research group, and inputs for new versions. We are in the process of preparing a new version. For sure, there will be a new version for Madrid meeting, uh, but probably before even before there will be some, some other versions. And just to reflect the fact that uh, Jeff Fansula has joined us as co-author. So we are open for contributions, and we expect that this could have uh, interest for the for the research group. And that's all from my side. Thank you. Thanks, Luis. Uh, let me just check the chat because in the window. Uh, hi. Uh, I just uh, I just have one question, if I may. Uh, I'm just wondering, in terms of your uh, attributes at the in, uh, intent uh, for the transport slice layer, do you envisage that uh, the, the 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 attributes would be uh, delay jitter, etc., or would the attribute be a, a more uh, a higher level declarative in terms of uh, who needs this kind of slice, for example? Is it EMBB? Is it sliced for EMBB? Is it sliced for some of the specific types for 3GPP uh, service types? Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. So th there could be probably a combination of, of, uh, of both of them. So there would be something that could be more or less straightforward translated to transport requirements like uh, throughput, uh, which uh, basically can be translated to bandwidth or latency and so. 
and there will be other attributes that are not directly are, are indirectly impacting the, the transport network for instance reliability or reliability is maybe it could make the the transport network to create uh, some protecting paths in order to accomplish uh, a given reliability or even if, if the slice template uh, declares the need of uh, deploying a service in a given location so indirectly you can infer the needs of having transport capabilities in, in that area in that geographical area and so so there could be probably a mix of of, of the of both of them so what we are doing in, in one of the works that I refer there, the, the um, draft Contreras uh, is, uh, MBI, is trying to digest how these attributes could impact directly or indirectly in the transport part. So there is a, a parallel ongoing work on, on this direction. So I invite you to check and, and, and document it. Thanks. So you, you envisage that it would be more like specific requirements, not uh, high level requirements saving, saying, give me the slice for this application. And then that the transport layer understands the requirements in terms of bandwidth and delay and jitter from higher level abstraction. Let me see is that so the starting point is to, to take uh, the generic slice template from GSMA or the NEST, the equivalent in 3GPP. There we have um, a, um, attributes that really impact the, the transport, like throughput. So this is a day that we don't need to infer so much on that because if the slides need to support 100G, so we need to provide 100G. But it will be some other attributes that probably will be more generic and should be, and required to be processed. Like in the example that I mentioned before about reliability. So if you need to guarantee 99.9090 percent of of uh, service availability then probably i need to um, instantiate different paths in the transport part in order to guarantee such level of availability so it could be probably a mix of them or a starting point let me remark this is the generic slice template so we are starting from that uh, going at higher level uh, like mbb or ulc and so Probably is not enough, but we need something else to to step. I mean, you you need some kind of attributes, and all the starting point is the GST, and we are working from that. I'm not sure if I am able to fully address your question. If, if not, we can talk offline. Yeah, thanks. For Thank you very much. Okay, I see that Eric uh, raised hands and asked a question. Yeah, sorry, I had to mute myself. Um, so just as a clarification, and just to expand on what you were just saying, um, the, the intent in the work that's going on right now is that the transport network doesn't understand the, rec the, the actual applications that are applying, uh, applying for us transport slice. So the, the intent would not include any information about exactly what this slice is used for just information about how what what the characterizations are or the attributes as, as Lee says um, that are are to be communicated to the transport system yes that's the point yeah yeah that, that's the point yes Um, so I don't know if Eric uh, was okay for you, but since we're also running a bit late with respect to the initial agenda, I would like to um, close the discussion now. I think it's a um, new uh, internet draft that we have for the group. I think there are interesting points to be further developed and some interaction as we have seen uh, with other members of the group. So I hope that this will continue uh, on the mailing list or in before the next uh, virtual or in-person meetings. And so. We'll have I think, more time to, to, to investigate some of those points further, and I would like to switch to the next presentation, please. Okay, thanks, Luis, for the presentation and the input to the group. Thank you. Our next presentation will be um, Navid uh, on automated design of network services uh, from network service requirements. And uh, so, as we are running late, if you can be quite
quite to the point, this will be appreciated. Let me just bring up the slides. Hi. <clears throat> yes, sure. Floor is yours. Uh, thank you. I'm not seeing it yet. Yes, here it is. Um, okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Navid, and my presentation today is on the project automated design of network services from network service requirements. And this project was a research project in uh, Concordia University in Montreal, and uh, it is in collaboration with Ericsson, uh, and it's uh, supervised by uh, Dr. Farah Kendek and Dr. Maria Toro from Ericsson. Uh, next slide, please. So my outline will be uh, a quick background, then the motivation and the goal of the project, uh, an overall picture of our method, uh, and after that, uh, talking about the modeling framework that we have, and then uh, discussing the, the method steps and the prototype tool that we have designed, developed, and uh, finally conclude in the future. Next slide, please. Uh, so as a quick background, um, so a network service is an interconnection of network functions that provide uh, a composite functionality or behavior as a general uh, concept. Uh, network function uh, is a functional block in a network uh, with defined functionality and external interfaces. Um, so as I hope you all are familiar with NFV system, uh, network function virtualization, network functions and network services can be deployed in network uh, NFE system and uh, one of the main manage management uh, blocks in NFE system is NFE management and orchestration or MANO. MANO requires a deployment template for a network service in order to deploy uh, a network service in the NFE system and that template is called network service descriptor which describes the network service from a uh, virtualization aspect. Uh, next slide please. So NFC generation requires uh, designing uh, the desired network service to begin with. And the design process is uh, the process of selecting uh, proper network functions and arranging them together to achieve the composite functionality and behavior. This is out of the scope of NFC and uh, it is done manually by experts today. The issue with that is NS design process is knowledge extensive, meaning uh, many different tenants might want uh, different types of network services for different domains, and that's really knowledge extensive to design. And manual NSC generation is also error prone because of the many details in NSDs. And in general, that doesn't fit in telecom zero touch vision. Um, so automation of NSD and NSD design is desirable, is highly desirable. Uh, next is on, next. Uh, so the goal of our project is to devise a method for automatic uh, network service design that fulfills the tenant's uh, intents, whether high level or low level. Uh, those intents are basically the network service requirements, we call them NS4. Um, generating, so uh, the, the main goal is to generate, and then after designing the NS, is to generate the NSs according to uh, the ETSI's NFE standards to be used by NFE manual for NS uh, management and orchestration. And our methodology is a model-driven approach because of the, the direction of ETSI uh, and leveraging their models. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so the overall picture of our method starts from the tenant providing us uh, with the intent. And the output goal is the NSD, uh, standard NSD, but there is a huge gap in between uh, because the, the intents are high level and the NSD is at the low level. Uh, next slide, please. So we fill this gap with uh, our method. Uh, so we take the, the intents or the NS rec from the tenant and we map it to a knowledge base, which we call network function ontology. It has the knowledge of network function and the compositions and all the architectural uh, information for network service design. So we decompose our NS rec to lower level uh, information. And then based on that, we select appropriate DNFs from a catalog. And then we generate forward graphs according to those knowledge. And then finally, we generate NSDs that can be used by NFT manner. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so as I said, uh, our approach is model-driven. 
so we have a modeling framework and the basis of it uh, starts from this picture. Every network function uh, from two different aspects. One is functional and the other is architectural. Uh, from a functional perspective, a network function uh, is a functionality, provides a functionality. And from an architectural perspective, uh, from a more concrete uh, point of view, that functionality can be realized by a more concrete a more concrete um, element, like an architectural block, as we call it. And uh, for, for instance, an architectural block defines the, the interfaces and the protocols used uh, to realize that functionality. And our assumption is, I mean, based on our definition, the real implementation out there, like VNX and PNX, uh, virtual network functions and physical network functions are implementations according to those architectural blocks. Next slide, please. So, keeping that basis in mind, I start from introducing our NS model. Um, I start from an example. Uh, let's consider a tenant requires a vault service uh, with voice call and registration functionalities and uh, six megabit per second throughput for voice call and 50 uh, registrations per second. Uh, and the constraint is using IMS architecture. So, the way we model it is shown in this picture. Uh, you can see the vaulty uh, decomposed to voice spot and registration, and you can see the non-functional requirements attached to the six megabit per second, the, the throughput and the request per second, and the, the architectural constraints. So that's the way we model. Uh, and if you go to the next slide, I can show the, the overall picture of the meta model. So here is a, an overview of the ns meta model. Uh, an strict meta model consists of functional requirements, architectural requirements, and non-functional requirements. Um, as you can see, functional requirements can be decomposed to real level functional requirements, and uh, other blocks can be attached to each functional requirement. And here you can see a, a, a small overview of the real meta model, uh, which we use a UML and profiling methodology as well to model our meta models. Uh, next slide, please. So next up is uh, the ontology, the, the knowledge base that we capture knowledge into. Uh, the ontology uh, structure is quite similar to, and to the ns meta model, but it, it, it consists of, of more details and more information. Uh, so the first picture you see is an overview of our meta model. Uh, ontology meta model consists of functionalities uh, and their decomposition to lower level functionalities, and on the other side, architectural blocks and uh, their different decompositions. And these decompositions can be, can be captured from standards and uh, different research papers or any knowledge out there. An expert can uh, enrich this ontology. And here uh, in, at the bottom, you can see a picture of uh, a re an instance of this ontology. So you can see uh, a vaulty with its complete decomposition to lower level functionalities like messaging, voice call, authentication, registration, user for storage. And on the left side, you can see uh, the architecture of an IMS system. And you can see the relation and how those functionalities can be realized by these IMS blocks. And that's how we capture the knowledge of uh, functional decomposition in, in general work for service uh, design. Next slide. Here, uh, quickly, uh, I discussed uh, the VNF virtual network functions information uh, models as well. So VNFs are standardized by Etsy, and they provide uh, the, they provide the, the meta model for those information elements, including VNF descriptor and some other architecture. But those are all uh, virtualization, provide information from the aspect of virtualization perspective. So, but for NS design, uh, we need application perspective uh, information. So we have proposed an extension to this uh, VNF information elements and we call it VNF architecture descriptor. That VNF architecture descriptor provides us with, with the information about VNF functionality, VNF components functionalities, and VNF application interfaces. And we assume that this VNF is all, this VNF architecture descriptor is also provided from the vendor. So we capture all these information uh, and we put them in a catalog. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so 
I talked about uh, those three main uh, information elements that we use as our inputs. Uh, and here, that's how we process them. So the first step, uh, we generate a, a solution map model. Uh, we initialize a solution map model. It's an intermediary model that captures all the information throughout the NSD generation process. Uh, in step two, uh, we, we have, to begin with, we have the information from the NS rig into the solution map. So in step two, we map the solution map to the ontology and we traverse ontology, we capture uh, the subtrees uh, on the functional side and architectural side that matches those inter those uh, requirements and we capture them, put them in, into our solution map. In the third step, uh, we take those captured architectural blocks and we go look uh, through our VNF catalog and we select the proper VNFs matching those architectural blocks and we bring them and put them in our solution map in relation with architectural blocks. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, then after that, uh, now we have all the uh, information that we need from the ontology, but we need to separate alternate alternative solutions because you can see that uh, we have multiple levels and layers of decomposition. So in three sub-steps, uh, we separate those alternative solutions. First, uh, we, we look at the functional decomposition and we generate a functional for our data. Those are sequences of functionalities that each of them, all of its functionalities together can compose uh, the root functionality that is desired for the network service. So after generating all possible forwarding graphs, from each of them we generate architectural forwarding graphs, which is uh, a sequence of architectural blocks that realizes those functionality. And after that, uh, with the same token, uh, we generate pre-VNF FTs, which is basically uh, VNF forwarding graphs, but without networking elements like neutral links and uh, the detailed flows. So each pre VNFFG is basically a, a combination of VNF forwarding, a combination of VNFs that can all together compose the desired network service. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, as I said, each pre VNFFG is a, is, can be a potential solution. So for each pre VNFFG, we generate a generic network service descriptor. Uh, because it has all the VNFs that uh, can compose the network service. And uh, I call it generic because they are just with respect to functionality and architecture, uh, just composition of architectural blocks, not uh, the networking part and not the virtual ones. So in this part, in this step, uh, we generate the virtual, we design the virtual links, we design the service access points, uh, and we generate the descriptors. And we generate uh, the VNF forwarding graph descriptors as well. Uh, we have a step to also enrich our ontology uh, if uh, the NST generation was successful so far. So we take new information coming from the, the NS frame and uh, we try to enrich our ontology. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this is the final step uh, of our method. So in this step, we take the non-functional requirements uh, into account. If you remember, uh, in my example, I showed like two bits or uh, requests per second those kind of requirements. So, but first uh, we design the flows, uh, we design the flows according to uh, the tenant requirements, wherever he or she has required, requested for a specific load on um, some functionality. So according to the, according to those, we design uh, different flows, packet flows, and we use dependencies between the virtual, between the VNFs and uh, using the internal flows of VMs, which those information have been captured so far, we design the flows. And then uh, we take those non-functional requirements and we propagate them throughout these flows to anticipate uh, the load that are supposed to be uh, exposed on each VNF. Therefore, we are able to dimension each VNF by uh, anticipating that load. Um, so by considering that load and uh, the deployment flavors of each VNF, uh, we dimension the VNFs and we tailor the deployment flavor of the network service. And that's the end point of our method. So at this point, uh, we have designed the network service descriptor, which uh, we have anticipated the load for the VNFs and we have dimensioned them and we have 
tailored uh, the ELF, the net of service to speak with. Um, next slide, please. So we have developed the prototype tool as a, a proof of concept. Um, as I mentioned, our methodology is model driven. Um, we use uh, Atlas transformation language and uh, we use UML profiling to, to basically provide our meta models, to create our meta models, and use papyrus environment to generate our models, UML models. And the use case that we had previously was multi service using Atlas architecture. Um, the next slide would be my conclusion slide. So, so far we have proposed a method to automatically design network services based on network service requirements or uh, the intents for the network services that tenants have. By decomposing those intents uh, using the knowledge base and then selecting the suitable Linux from a catalog accordingly and then design the forward and graphs. And uh, based on the, that design, generated all possible NSDs that can be used by Nano and define those NSDs according to Nano. As a future work, work right now, we are working on validating our method further with uh, several case studies, uh, specifically with 3GPP mission protocol system. And also another parallel work we are working on in the group, but it's being done by another person is on uh, with the same concept, but designing network slices, uh, automatic network slice design, which is the same principle, but with more details and more uh, features. So thank you very much uh, for listening, and I'm more happy to answer your questions. Thanks a lot, Navid, and uh, to be very uh, on the point concerning time. I see that uh, Sheen has a question uh, on the chat. Uh, you may raise it uh, vocally if you like, please. Yeah, how VNF architecture descriptor is different from NSD. And goal seems to generate NSD. Yes, so, well, a VNF is uh, a virtual network function, and a network service is a composition of VNFs. Uh, so, uh, first, this VNF architecture descriptor is a descriptor for that VNF, but the NSD is a descriptor for the network service, which is a higher level, more composite element. Uh, other than that, also, uh, VNF architecture descriptor is our extension. Uh, it consists of information uh, regarding application aspect of that VNF. Um, in opposed to descriptors, which Etsy provides, those are just virtualization aspect elements, meaning they just provide information regarding what's the structure of this, uh, let's say, uh, VNF as a virtualized uh, element. For instance, what are its components inside, how they are, uh, how they are configured together, how, how they are uh, connected together through virtual links, what are their uh, external connection points? But they don't talk about their functionalities. They don't talk about their, for instance, APIs, which are uh, regarding the functionalities. So this VNF architecture descriptor captures those architectural aspect information, um, opposed to the descriptors. I hope you felt it. If I was able to answer your question, please let me know. Okay, uh, Jérôme also is uh, willing to make a comment. Yes, <coughs> just, just a question regarding the, um, um, the, the, the description of requirements for network service. Uh, is there, in your, in your approach, in your, in your work, is there a way to, to have requirements that uh, have some dependency in a way that, uh, I mean, uh, not all requirements must need to be fulfilled at the same time. It can be combination of requirement and uh, some exception or let's say uh, alternative requirements. Is there a way to, to to define such kind of things or not? Uh, by that you mean, uh, for instance, I'm just clarifying myself for understanding your question. So you mean in uh, the requirements, uh, we have we have multiple uh, different types of requirements and how we 
capture them all together or how we resolve the contradictions? Is that right? Yeah, but basically, if you have some requirements that are uh, alternative, like you imagine uh, you have some logic between requirements, like uh, R, usually requirements are just kind of uh, conditions that all need to be fulfilled, but uh, uh, some kind of may have more complex requirement for yeah. certain service, I suppose. Yes. Uh, well, <clears throat> so the requirements that we get, we match them to the ontology, and uh, therefore, we start from the high level requirements and uh, traverse down, and every time we reach one of those uh, blocks of requirement, we try to match them to our ontology because uh, we rely on the, the knowledge provided from the ontology. So, any uh, requirement that is in contradiction to the ontology, uh, for instance, let's say there is a composition or there is a dependency that uh, the complete opposite of it is provided in the ontology. We make like that requirement and we stick to the ontology because uh, we assume that uh, tenants might not provide us with uh, a fully uh, compatible requirement. So we stick to the ontology basically uh, and we resolve those requirements by taking from the knowledge from the ontology. That gives us information. Yes, yes, okay, okay, yeah, okay. that's good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so if there are no further questions, we will move to the next presentation. Thanks, uh, Navid, for this uh, interesting work. And I think we will uh, get in touch for, for the next steps. Thank you. Okay, so our next one is the uh, Julian. On intent classification. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Let me just bring up the slide. Okay, the floor is yours. Sorry, I didn't say anything. Can anybody see the slide or not? Yes, I can see. Yes. Oh, yes. Sure. For you, it's okay. Ah uh, yes, okay. Uh, hello everyone. My name is Sun Xueyuan from China Telecom. Next, let me introduce the draft of intent classification. The next slide, please. Excuse me. I'm on slide two. There was some delay, but now it's uh, slide two. Okay. The goal of this draft is to bring clarity to what an intent represents for different stakeholders by means of classification of various dimensions, such as solutions, users and the intent types. This classification would ensure a common understanding across all participants, and it can be used to identify the scope and the priorities of individual projects, POCs, research or open source projects. This is achieved by proposing initial classification tables and the methodology used for generating them. This methodology can be used to update the tables by adding or removing different solutions, users, or intent types in order to cater for future scenarios, applications, or domains. 
This draft together with the draft RTF NMRG and BN concepts definitions M2 aims to become the foundation for future intent related topic discussions where all participants have the same common understanding. Next, please. Since the update of the draft version 2 in November 2019, we have received the support of experts and suggestions for improvement to the draft. The following is a summary of all the comments we received offline and online, and address the corresponding solutions one by one. Like the comment expressed by Jurgen that alignment with the draft climate NMRG is the intent three, we addressed by updating the draft and referring in the introduction to climate and explaining what the scope of the each draft. Jerome and Laurent commented that the value of the document and the table is not clearly explained. As well, Branislav Miazia commented that intent obstruction should be formal. Therefore, we addressed by updating the introduction section and the discussions on the mailing list, as well as explaining in the introduction the purpose of this draft and that it is not planned to be a formal definition of intent. Yahya Al Khatib said on the mini list that it is not clear what is the difference between intent and the policy in our draft. And we addressed by updating the introduction and the referencing plan draft that describes the differences between service, policy, and intent. As well, we updated the section four and the subsections 4.3, 4, 5, and 6 by making them intent and not policy focused. Similarly, we also have received some suggestions such as Jerome and Laurent suggested that our draft should present intent and methodology. And we adopted by adding a new subsection 5.1 and 5.2. Jerome also advised that it would be better if we could have some concrete examples of intents from different perspectives. In response to, the to this suggestion, we have added examples to the tables in section 5.1, uh, 5.3.1, 5.4.1, and 5.5.1. Natalie Bob commented that it is unclear what is the scope of the policy continuum section in this draft. Thus, we have removed the section in the draft. In summary, we updated the draft to version 3 as follows. In section 1, we updated the introduction to clarify the scope of the draft. In section 4, we updated the section 4 to make it more intent and not policy focused. And in section 5, we added the intent classification methodology and the examples for the intent tabs. And in, sex, in section six, we removed the policy continuum section. Okay, next is last, please. For ease of viewing, the place market in red are the major changes of this draft. It can be seen that in section four, we have made many changes compared to the previous version, such as adding new subsections about intent scope and the intent network scope, and modifying the content of the original subsections about intent abstraction and the lap cycle, and adjusting the logical relationships between each subsections. Next, I will detail the, the, updated, the updated content of each part. Next, please. First of all, in section five, we added the intent classification methodology as shown on the right. The proposed methodology can be used to create new intent classifications from scratch by analyzing the solution knowledge, as well to update existing classification tables by adding or removing different solutions, users, or intent types in order to cater for future scenarios, applications, or domains. We first, we first 
uh, classify intents into intent types and uh, describe each type based on the solution it belongs to and uh, what uh, intent user it is for. We then present different uh, categories that this intent type can belong to based on intent scope, network scope, intent abstraction, and the life cycle. In the above methodology, the all arrows means the following. Input represents the solution knowledge comparison of knowledge about solution requirements, target use cases, available technologies and networks, actors, intent requirements. And the RX UX arrows mean reviewing the existing classification and the use, add, remove the intent solution, user tabs, intent tabs, and etc. Okay, next, please. In addition, we have added, added internet examples for all intent tabs in all the tables in section 5.3.1 and 4.1 and 5.1. The picture on the right is snippet, is snippet from carrier solution table in section 5.3.1. For example, for a network operator, when the intent tab is network or service intent, the, oper the operations that may be desired is request a network service with delay guarantee for access customer A. Okay, next slide, please. And in section four, we updated this section to make it more intent and not policy focused. We newly added uh, 4.3 and 4.4 subsections and updated 4.5 and 4.6 subsections. In subsection 4.3, we defined the scope of the intent. The intent are used to manage the behavior of the networks they are applied to, and all intents are applied within a specific scope such as connectivity, security application, and QoS scope. And in subsection 4.4, regardless on the intent user type, their intent request is affecting the network or network components, which are responsible representing the intent targets. Thus, intent network scope can represent VNFs or PNFs, physical network elements, campus networks, SD1 networks, and the cloud edge, cloud core branch, and so on. The next slide, please. Furthermore, we updated the 5.5, renamed as Intent Abstraction to focus on characteristics of feedback of intent. And the intent can be classified by whether it is necessary to feedback a technology technical network information or non-technical information to the intended proponent after the intent is executed. As well, intent abstraction covers the level of technical details in the intent itself. And we also update 4.6 intent life cycle as renamed the live intent life cycle to classify intent into transient, transient and persistent. If, trans, uh, if the intent is transcendent, it has no life cycle management as soon as the specific specified operation is successfully carried out. The intent is finished and can no longer affect the target object. If the intent is persi persistent, it has life cycle management. Once the intent is successfully activated and deployed, the system will keep all relevant intents active until they are deactivated or removed. The next slide, please. In section one, we have updated the introduction to better explain the need of intent classification and acknowledge crime draft for defining different intent concepts and the terminology. CLAM is currently leading these efforts by defining intent as higher level 
declarity or more positive that operates at the level of network and the services it provides. However, even with proposed intent concepts and terminology and agreement on common intent characteristics, an intent may still be viewed in different ways by different stakeholders for different use cases and solutions. Thus, the goal of this draft is to bring clarity to what an intent represents for different stakeholders by means of classification on various dimensions. The classification would ensure a common understanding across all participants, and it can be used to identify the scope and the priorities of individual projects, POCs, research, or open source projects. This draft, together with CLIMB, aims to become the foundation for future intent related topic discussions where all participants have the same common understanding. Okay, the next slide, please. Conclusion, the current vision has addressed all the comments received online and offline. And furthermore, we want to ask for adoption as a research group draft sincerely. Regarding the next step of this draft, we summary the following work plans. First, add a section briefly describing intent work status related to intent classification and uh, taxonomy in other SDOs, such as the 3GPP and the ETSA and MES. And uh, we keep the draft aligned with the draft ARTF and MRG IBN concepts definitions. What's more, work with the community to derive unified intent definition that uh, encompasses all intent types for all solutions and the intent users. At last, improve the draft further based on any new comments. The above are all in introductions to this draft update, that's all. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Jan. <laughs> we will check on the uh, chat uh, there are comments or questions on the presentation. Okay, uh, maybe uh, Jérôme speaking um, uh, as a chair regarding uh, your, your last slide. Um, so first of all, thank you for your, for your very hard work to improve uh, the document and answer a different question. Uh, regarding the process, uh, one of the suggestions I would like to, uh, to give to you maybe is first to publish the re revised version as a, as a version free of the individual draft. I think that will be the first step. And then before going for asking for the adoption, my advice will be first to uh, go for a very short round of uh, comments regarding this version free on the mailing list, like two weeks, in particular from people having a comment on the previous version to see if they are satisfied with uh, how you address the comment. And uh, then after this, Check if everything is fine. Maybe the the, the good we, we can we maybe ask for adoption officially for the uh, for the document. That will be uh, uh, my advice as a chair uh, to uh, to be sure that before you ask for adoption, which will be somehow enter into let's say official process. Uh, the comments you receive from uh, previous from uh, people who have previously made this comment uh, are okay with. On, on the manner you, you modify the document. But of course, do not forget to first publish the, the, the version free of the document. I know you send it on the mailing list, but uh, please upload on the data tracker uh, that is, uh, is, uh, is fully shared and uh, into, the, into the document of the, of the group. Would that be okay with you? I just uh, give a comment, uh, 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 Jerome. Like, I think, thank you very much for your suggestion also, but I, I just wanted to say in regards to the comments to engage the comment authors, uh, I think just to remind that we went through the extensive phase of emails and PowerPoints with all the comments and asking the comment authors for their uh, 
for their conclusions and, and for their feedbacks in regards to how we want to address the comments. So I just wanted to remind you about that, uh, that we went probably, I would say, a month of exchanges and, and discussions, but I do believe it is better to do it with the version 3, so thank you very much. We will repeat the process, but I, I just want to remind that we tried to do that already and we we'll, had PowerPoints with all the comments and asked for people to reply, but uh, we didn't get replies from everybody. Okay, I understand your point. So, uh, as, a, as in a role of culture, if you if you publish this as version three, we will also push a bit on the mailing list, so that people, including me uh, as a personal as well, uh, uh, reply to the to the on on your document and all you have addressed the comments. To give you the feedback in a, in a relative short period of time, like as I said, two or three weeks maximum. Uh, also to to support this work because I think it's it's good. You made a, a lot of uh, very uh, concrete modification to the document. But yeah, for, for me, it's if if you go in this way, it's better than before you go into the process of adoption, and then you have to wait and, uh, and maybe a bit more. Uh, it will be it will be sure that at least you have all more chance. Uh, to have uh, the document then adopted uh, for in the group, it just it just kind of uh, 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 for uh, for the sake of uh, of checking that uh, the way you address the document is aligned with the document you receive. There are, there are no misunderstandings. But of course, as chair, we can push a bit on the mailing list that you receive comments and uh, as well. Is that okay. Any further comments concerning the next step for this draft? What we could do also, because we, we already had the first uh, call for research group adoption in December for this draft, and after that, there have been only the, the group uh, behind the scene and all by, by the author and other uh, involved participants. So maybe we could clarify uh, by email to the list uh, the discussion today. What we have seen in the slide presented today, uh, our recommendation as chairs for publication of uh, V03 uh, to be the new baseline and ask for comments for a period of, of two weeks. And uh, then at the conclusion of this period to be able to restart a new call for adoption. So if you can clarify this by email, I think it will make a good point on the mailing list uh, with respect to the previous call. Yes, agree. Okay, thanks Julian for, for the presentation. Uh, I know it's already quite late also for our participants in, uh, in Asia. Um, so we will move on. I think the next slide is, um, it should be Benoit for an update on the um, uh, service assurance for internet based architecture. Let me just grab the right slide set. All right, so in this uh, 15 minutes, I want to present uh, two drafts that have been presented to the OPSWG. But uh, as you were mentioning, uh, Laurent, at the beginning, they're highly relevant to, uh, to NMRG. So the two drafts are mentioned there. Uh, the things that I want to mention first is that we believe we address most of the feedback received in uh, NMRG last time, verbally, or uh, many verbally on the, during the the research group session, and also the feedback received from the OCWG. The second thing is that we, you would see from the list of authors, we've been working with many operators, and I see uh, Paolo and Diego on the list here. So much feedback uh, addressed there. So next slide, please. The, the, the issue we're having is that, yes, we've got Yang, yes, we could configure networks, but the fact is that we all know it. We've got like a service configure, but it doesn't mean that it's operating correctly. There could be many issues there. Now we're telling, okay, we're going to send telemetry, but we, we see it coming. We've got like way too much telemetry. This is the issue of the needle in the haystack, right? Uh, now, whenever a service degrades, the, the, the thing is any knock 
wants to discover where the fault is. And by this, I mean, there are easy ones like, okay, there is the root code interface is down, for example. Great, we know it almost directly. But whenever we've got like symptoms, it gets like most difficult. If it's A and B and sometimes C, then we have the symptoms to know what's happening. The other issue we're trying to solve is that, okay, now I've got like a component that fails, that's an optic or fails or, or degrades. Now, which services are impacted? This is also key to understand. Now, we, we have to understand as well, the first step is like close loop automation. This is what we're trying to solve here. And the next slide, please. However, we know that the end goal, this is like intent-based networking, but it's like a, a pyramid of needs, right? You're able to do configuration, then you've got operational data with telemetry, then you close the loop. Then uh, whenever you close the loop, you could potentially go to self star to intent base, right? And this is what we're trying to do, trying to decompose this from bottom up and trying to decompose this into smaller components, what we call a subservice. Then we've got an assurance graph that is going to link those subservices and we're going to have, so we're going to map it to a service intent. I'm going to show you how we'll do it. Then the idea would be to uh, assure all these subservices independently, right? I mean, it's a fact that we all collect like the interface counters, but okay, so what? To have a nice graph, it would be way better to understand if the interface behaves correctly, right? Then we would have like a health score for the interface health. Now, because you've got the assurance graph, we could uh, bubble up the inferred scope of the service and I want to stress inferred right because this this architecture complements the end-to-end -end active probing right where we're going to get like uh, the the real packet loss and, and delay and, and, and jitter and all this so whenever you've got those two solutions then it we start to have a good architecture next slide please So if I take a very simple, the simplest service you could have, like a tunnel, right? We take a tunnel instance. And then uh, if you look at the dependency tree, the assurance graph, we want to have for the tunnels to be healthy. We want to have on the left-hand side, the tunnel interface peer one being healthy, as well as the peer two being a destination. And those two have, rely on the health of a physical interface. Right, and, and then they, they, they rely on the health of the device. You know, it would be way easier if you would have like a device and the ability to say this device is healthy. So if you look for a problem, this is not where the problem is. And on the right side, the tunnel service instance also depends on the IP connectivity between A to B or peer one, peer two, that also depends on a, on a control plane, in this case, ISIS. So we've got the source at the top and the subservices, the subservice instances at, at the bottom. All right, next. And uh, I think you went one too far. One slide before, please. Oh yeah, that's one, yes. So uh, then what we could be doing there is, uh, as I mentioned, if we know that the interface is like unhealthy, an optic is bad, is degraded, right? We have a, the health of that interface, of that optic, sorry. And then we could just say, well, obviously, because you've got the assurance graph, this specific tunnel service instance is affected. So I could infer the health of a tunnel service instance by looking at the health of the components in the tree, the assurance graph. And now on the next slide, I, I want to show that there are two different types of dependencies, right? Uh, obviously, if I got like an interface being down, that's obvious that my tunnel will be down. It's what we call an impacting dependency, right? This is the root cause, we know it. And on the next slide, we've got like typically an informational dependency, meaning I've got this tunnel service, but it goes over four ECMP paths, right? One of them is down. Is my service impacted, yes or no? Maybe yes, maybe no, right? But the point is that I want to be aware of that symptom. 
And this is what we mentioned by informal informational dependency here. Because that symptom combined with the different symptoms, let's say I see a package, a packet distribution change in interface, and I see an ECMP issue, uh, for example, because there is like a bad load balancing, we might find a correlation between those two events. All right, on the next slide. Trying to summarize what we've seen so far, when a service degrades, we could discover what the fault is, whether it's just a symptom or a root cause. But most of the time, the most uh, interesting ones are the symptoms because the root cause are, are, are easy. And then we know also that whenever a component fails, I was mentioning the optic, then we know which service instances are impacted. All right, next please. I want to show here that trying to standardize something here is like trying to standardize an architecture, sorry. Uh, and we try to do it for a multi vendor. It has to be because there are not many networks in the world that are only a um, single vendor. And we did it with the Yang module. It was somehow my, my feedback to one of the previous drafts that with Yang we could deduce. Uh, we could generate APIs. And this architecture is uh, flexible in terms of components. I will show you that. In terms of service and subservices. So we could be adding new subservices as we see them, right? If someone needs multicast, we could add a multicast subservice and expand the actions graph. It's also flexible and open in terms of distributed graphs because we see it coming different controllers could have part of the graphs, or even like in routers, you could have part of the graphs. And uh, to refer to one of the previous uh, presentation, it, it works for physical and virtual. So next, please. So this is the architecture. So we get the intent from uh, the service configuration orchestrator we get like the service ID, the service uh, config, and then we extract the intent of that service. We create the assurance graph that goes into some SANE agent. And then we collect the required metric via telemetry. And we send the health score and the symptoms of all of those subservices along with this assurance graph. And then we have all the information that we need to potentially uh, close the loop. And the value of this is that it's all model based. Uh, so both the config and telemetry. So we're comparing apples to apples. The next slides, I want to show that basically it's flexible in terms of components. We could have like the same agent in, uh, in router that switches and we could have like the, the orchestrator and the same orchestrator both uh, into a single box. The point in the next slide is that what we want to do is to have this open architecture monitor, so we want to specify the interfaces. So this is where we've got the arrows with Yang, and they want to be open, so they are there with a Yang module. However, in the next slides, what we don't want to do is we don't want to standardize an orchestrator or an agent. Basically, this is software, right? It would be like uh, forcing a specification of an implementation. It's way better to have like the uh, the APIs. All right. Now, next slide, please. If I look at the the Yang models here very quickly, right? I don't want to go into details of Yang, but we have model dependency relationship by telling impacting informational. On the next slide, we have uh, also a model, the health score and the symptoms per subservice. In the next slides, we've been adding uh, a maintenance window. Typically, I mean, if you're upgrading or a device or if you're replacing this bad optic or if you're doing a routing, routing product adjustment, you don't want to receive any symptoms from that specific subservice. So you could just disable receiving symptoms there. All right, in the next slides. 
One of the new additions is that we've been adding like a, a, a Yang module for the assurance of the interface. And somehow it shows like if you're assuring a device, you've got the device ID as a parameter. If you are assuring, so an, assuring an interface, you are assuring, you, you need two parameters, a device ID and interface ID. And we, we showed how we could extend this, even with some vendor specific subservices, right? In my first slide, for example, if I've got like a, a Nokia, Huawei or Juniper device, I should be the one having the, the device health. All right, and I think you'll be happy, Laurent. My next slide is the last one. Uh, something that uh, needs to be improved. This is uh, I need to align the the draft better with the the NMRG concept and definition. Now the feedback I've been asking is like, uh, is this a valid problem to solve at the ITF? And now we're going in the right. Uh, direction. And then I asked that question to the OPS WG. Uh, it was for group adoption. However, the feedback of this group is uh, that it's, I would like to get the feedback to make sure that all the concept definition that we're going the right discussion according to what's uh, discussed in the research. So thank you. Thank you, Benoit. I think on the chat we have at least uh, Louis raising in. Louis, you may need to unmute. We cannot hear you. Apologies. Yeah, my, my question is uh, the, uh, for Benoit: is uh, do you intend also to work in the uh, in the standardization of these subservices, or is just uh, do, do you plan just to stay on the model, the overall model? I mean. So that's a very good question, and I believe the answer is yes and no. Yes, because there are some of them. Uh, that should be solidized. I'm thinking, you know, as I mentioned, we all monitoring like the uh, interface counters and whether whatever router vendor you have, trying to get like the health of an interface should be should, should be then the standard. This is not where the value is, right? Uh, the value is higher in the in the in the stack. So some of them, yes, for protocols. I was mentioning ISIS on purpose, right? Or, or segment routing or Spring. What if we would be thinking directly about the assurance whenever we're, we're developing uh, a protocol? I could envision having a couple of subservice assurance Yang model, like interface, like for some protocol. We've got the knowledge in the ITF, and, and as I said, this is not what the value is for, for all the vendors. Make sense? Yeah. Uh, we have Alex. Yes, hello, this is Alex. Uh, I have a quick question uh, because uh, one thing that made me curious is actually looking at your uh, looking at your tree view and your and your Yang module. You uh, maintain you expect to maintain all the dependencies as configured information. Uh, one question that I would have um, um, regarding the practicality of this because. Presumably, you're going to have a lot of the uh, interdependencies um, between a lot of objects. So, so um, do you have any comments on, on that? How you these relationships, a lot of dependencies, a lot of which may be uh, maybe highly dynamic uh, and uh, yeah, and so forth. That, that's right. I mean, you, you, you are fully right. So this would be a complex graph. So we could stay at different levels. You could just stay, stay at what was configured. Uh, as you know, uh, getting like the health of the IP connectivity that was mentioning in a slide, whatever. Just trying to get that and potentially trying to see where it goes. It goes from A to Z, going from B, C, D, et cetera, or ECMP. ECMP is dynamic, right, but per, per definition. Right. I mean, uh, if we could just solve the ECMP issue, that would be great. So, yes, there is a lot of dynamicity in there. Uh, we, we've been experimenting with code and this is what we're focusing on. And yes, it will be a huge graph. It could be as huge as you want. We're selling this also in the virtual world up north. Now, uh, yep, you're, you're right. There is a lot of interdependencies there. Alex. 
Okay, I think we have also Torales in the line. Thanks, uh, Benoit. Can you go back to the architecture um, uh, picture? Right, 11. Is it the one you want to see? Yeah. So I think the um, one of the interesting question to me is, you know, to run through some example of, of workflows, right? I think that's 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 uh, you know some some amount of work that would be good to understand what could be gotten out of this. So for example, um, the way I kind of imagine how this this ultimately works is that I have you know different levels of abstraction, right? What what comes from the service configuration orchestrators, um, you know, more high level, and then when it goes further down, then then I've got some some lower level, like let's say uh, existing Yang based configuration of individual network elements. And the way I see it, what 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 would be lovely is to have a way of attaching one level to the other through references, so that you know, when I look at configuration of a router, I would be able to see which of the, you know, services are, you know, requiring a particular configuration or vice versa. Um, when I basically want to do some inventory management or something like that, that at the service level, I can see, you know, um, what network components or, you know, configurations are there. So that that mutual referencing, um, you know, I'm, I'm not seeing this expressed, but that would ultimately, I guess, be something that um, you know the orchestrator might might need to do. What's what's your thought on this? Right. So you're right in that sense, right? So basically, we take a service model on top of an orchestrator, then we configure something with device. There are two different choices: either it's a CLI or this Yang. Right. If it's Yang, then we have a service solution because we already have the Yang models that we that we need for config, and then based on that, we could try to find a mapping. And it's easier if you start from Yang models. Case number two is that you start from CLI, and then it's it's harder to do. And I agree with you with the lower level, and that maybe also to answer Alex, is that okay? There are things that we know from the config of the service. There are things that we know from the network, right? I mentioned example with ISIS. Well, your service model will not configure ISIS. The IGP is there by default, right? So as a consequence, you need to learn it from the network. And there are extra things that we might want to have, like I mentioned multicast, right? We we might want to see if a specific service is multicast or not. And there we might need to have the operator input to construct the first graph. I mean to construct a graph the first time we've got the new service type. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. I mean the, the the whole concept of let's say we have two different levels, right? So it seems like, you know, just let's let's take just I mean. Ultimately, I think there will be multiple levels, right? But the, just the fact in the most simple case, we have two levels, let's say the service level and then the per device level configuration. Forget about the CLI stuff, agreed, uh, makes it more difficult. So device config is also Yang, but purely, you know, the abstraction models by which I can say, oh, okay, here I'm looking now at the device level configuration, but attached to each, I don't know, level or something else in the Yang device level configuration are pointers pointing back to the services that are requiring this. So that I'm basically this attribution. This of is what model. we've got in slide seven, right? Where we, we just say we've got the top of the assurance graph is the service ID that comes from the from the, uh, the orchestrator. And it says the top of this tree comes from the service. Uh, and this is the link that you that you need, right? So, oh, okay, right. So, I mean, this 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 was was very fast, and I think yeah, it's slide, it's, slide it's, seven. It's big... This is this one, yeah. The tunnel service I instance there it comes from the orchestrator, and you. This is something you configure, like an L2VP, an L3VP, and with an ID, with a customer, with a tenant, whatever. And then for that specific instance, you've got the, the entire tree there. So, so you would say that, uh, you know, one of the overheads might be if I want to be able on a router to kind of see the service dependencies, then the router ultimately would capture the whole tree, even if, you know, he isn't no, doing no, anything. I didn't mention that. I mentioned distributed. The router would know about 
part of the subservices, the device health, the interface health, uh, the telemetry health, whatever, but not the entire tree. However, because it's Yang, you could just have a leaf ref, right? Okay. And just, and okay. So let's take it offline, I guess, so Laura, this is what you want, right? Right, so you have, and, and, and all of these are existing Yang structural elements or does any of this requires, you know, structural enhancements to Yang? Thank you. Thanks, Benoit. Thank Thanks, people, for, for the nice uh, interactions. Uh, so I think we can keep uh, adding, I mean, um, again, interaction with this document. I know it's uh, also pro progressed uh, more in OPS AWG. Uh, but I think there are, again, links to, to the activity on, uh, on IBM in the research group. And as uh, Benoit mentioned in this last slide, uh, we expect further reviews and feedback on the completeness of the concept that he's considering. And I think any review and feedback are always valuable. So I would like to maintain this, this link active uh, to the to extent possible. And uh, we see how it goes for, for the next, uh, next steps. Thanks, Benoit. So next in the agenda will be a very quick updates. Uh, I apologize to everyone uh, for the exploded agenda we have. Uh, then maybe too, too, too much stuff. We're already uh, much over time. We will try to uh, go very quick on the last technical presentation and give uh, save a few minutes to give some research group updates uh, to the people that can uh, still be connected uh, at this time. So the next presentation will be on the update on intent-based networking concept and definition draft. Let me grab the slides. This should be very quick, hopefully. Um, so, um, I, I will present as a co-author uh, the the quick updates. So, this draft is the uh, I've been uh, so this is a version one of uh, uh, draft RTF and energy IBN concept and definitions. Uh, very recent history. So, this document was adopted as research group document in uh, December last year. Uh, we made some changes uh, in version zero one. Uh, essentially a complete editorial review of the, of the document. We have also uh, revised and aligned definitions for intent uh, throughout the document. This is uh, based essentially on the interaction on the mailing list and with uh, uh, the, the draft on intent classification, which triggered uh, some, uh, let us know about some inconsistency in the definition. So this was a, a good, uh, good catch. We have also reworked and improved uh, refined text uh, for the section five on principles. Uh, some of the principles were also um, a bit slightly uh, reworked. We swapped section six and section seven. So now the new section six is functionality and section seven is life cycle. Uh, this allows us to explain a bit before uh, going into the details of the diagram, a bit more uh, in a higher level, the main uh, functionality and the composition of, of the intent life cycle uh, from a textual point of view description point of view and then we have uh, in section new section seven uh, the, the the life cycle diagram and some uh, quick explanation of, of the diagram in this uh, life cycle section initially uh, we had two diagrams two kind of competing diagrams uh, so we decided to keep one uh, that was uh, comprehensive enough to, to, to cope for the different uh, elements of the life cycle we, we thought were essential for the draft uh, we still have to consolidate a bit further and still improve a bit on the uh, description of this life cycle, but now it's a bit more clear also for, for the external readers uh, about this uh, single life cycle diagram. And uh, I think one of the major updates we made uh, in version 01 was to add a complete new section on security considerations. Before that, we knew we wanted to address security consideration, even if it's a kind of conceptual document. But uh, since IBM is uh, not a completely new topic, but it addresses a new approach to how we do network management. We felt necessary to, uh, to think uh, in, in broad terms how the security consideration should be um, approached uh, for, for IBM. So I invite you to, to have a look uh, clearly in this uh, new, new section and give us some, uh, some feedback. Um, so this is for highlighting the main updates uh, on, on, on version zero, which was adopted to version one. Um, 
I'm not going into the details of the document structure, the, the details of anything because we don't have time first, and also because all this was uh, the status we had uh, in, uh, in the meeting in Singapore and in December, this has not changed, it's mainly uh, some re-architecting and improvement of the tech. For the next steps, um, so uh, we are working on the version 02, which uh, should be av available anytime soon. We will continue uh, to improve the, uh, I will say, uh, the text of the draft, um, we still have a, a few principles uh, that we wanted to add. They were in the, the kind of to-do list, uh, so we will uh, provide inputs for that. Uh, we will also work since the concept and definition draft, uh, slightly improve also the section on acronyms, terms, and definitions to have proper uh, entries into uh, this section of the document with respect to the concepts and definitions uh, defined uh, throughout the text. Uh, as I said, consolidation of the life cycle diagram. Uh, we will also uh, collect any feedback on the, if this is complete and, and good enough to, to, to proceed. And uh, we have uh, some pending comments and reviews that we received uh, some months ago and uh, more recently that we need to integrate in the different sections of the document. So this is uh, pretty stage forward in terms of evolution, knowing that um, this document uh, we believe uh, is Pretty stable. Uh, it's not finished, but uh, we don't expect to have major uh, re-architecting of the of the structure of the document. Uh, so, according to the uh, research group milestones, uh, there is a, a, a target to send this doc, the corresponding documents, not necessarily only this one, to IRSG review uh, by November 2020. So, this is still in our plan. Uh, but it will depend how we move on with the next version and the comments we may receive uh, for that. But in our perspective, as a group of co-authors, we think it's uh, becoming more and more stable, and it would be nice to reach these targets by the end of the year. That's it for the quick update on this document. Any comments? If not, okay, thanks. So uh, we are now going to continue with uh, the chair slides and uh, conclude this meeting with uh, some updates on the research group. Um, so to browse quickly, uh, Jerome also don't hesitate to uh, uh, add things uh, on my flow. The general information, we had our new charter approved um, uh, end of March, so this is still quite recent. So uh, congratulations and thanks to everyone that participated in providing inputs, comments, and support for um, the revised charter, the inputs in terms of technical uh, content, uh, review, etc., and also to uh, our RTF chair for bringing this forward. Uh, we initiated that a long time ago, but uh, I think it was really useful for uh, bringing a very nice research agenda for, for the uh, long-lasting research group and now we have um, a long list of uh, a very interesting and ambitious uh, items to investigate uh, i just copy paste a quick snapshot of the milestones you can find on the data tracker uh, it's not usual for a research group to have milestones but we believe that some of our work items um, deserve it and it will help us also to try to, to put energy and a bit of pace in our in our research there because I think the industry is expecting also some some answers and work could move towards also IETF and, and other other groups. Uh, we have also initiated a few months ago the uh, a GitHub uh, organization uh, for energy so you can uh, find the links here we invite you to join as contributors uh, and we will planning to host uh, repositories for of course research group documents but we can also offer uh, repositories for individual documents if you want to um, host it there uh, also for the code we have a few uh, implementation on IBM, IBM proof of concept that uh, we are going to port there and also we are looking forward uh, we are looking in uh, how we can use also uh, git uh, maybe as a uh, rendering engine for a kind of website uh, of um, the different resources hosted by NMRG so that this is a bit more uh, easier access than the data tracker for people that are a bit less uh, connected to the IHF uh, processes. Um, Jerome, maybe you can take the floor for this one? Yeah, sure. 
<clears throat> so here is, a, is an update of the activities regarding artificial intelligence uh, that we started in the group. So I think the first and uh, the major thing is this uh, research challenges document. Um, so this is something we, we talk a bit and in particular in, in, in Singapore where we wanted to have a, a document in order to, um, to uh, actually uh, have detailed description of the different challenges of artificial in intelligence uh, applied to network management use case. Uh, I'm not sure we have time to go through the, the, uh, the document itself, Laurent, or maybe I should just summarize like that. What do you think? We still have a bit of, of time. Okay, so maybe yeah, if you can open it. I will display quickly the, the document. I think we should try also to be um, concise. Not yes, to, yes. Uh, <laughs> okay, so, so just to, to, okay, so now we have the document. So uh, that will appear, but the idea is that uh, to, because I know that we, we know that a lot of people we are willing to contribute. We are submitting and so on, but we need also a bit to have some structure to to have the document uh, uh, written. So we started to to write a, a draft thing from a, a table of content that we presented uh, in a previous virtual meeting. So um, the idea is is this document. Of course, the core part of the document will be challenges related to AI in network management. We have identified some of them during. Uh, uh, some side meetings in previous uh, IETF, it may also be during some virtual meetings. So here in the, basically in the, in the, in the if you, if you go a bit below Laurent, you have the, you have the, the, the talk and the table of content uh, that is, uh, okay, a bit expanded. So there are two, two main sections, so challenges as well, and the goals of AI in network management as well. There are the two main sections that we would like to uh, work at this time. And of course, uh, maybe on the on the section on research challenges, uh, for each section, we provide some kind of uh, a guidelines, a question to answer to help people to know what type of contents we are expecting here, Yeah, as, as Laura highlighted here for challenges. And so for the different challenge we have, identified, but of course you can add some challenges that you have in mind. Uh, you should try to write the text in a way that you answer the different questions. And of course you should identify yourself and interest contributors to this document. Here is a draft example uh, I've wrote on a lightweight AI for network management. Of course, because you have different sections, so, um, and also it, it needs to be documented with reference and so on to have already something quite concrete. And uh, of course, then here you have item two, three, four, and five. That, that are other challenges um, we have uh, we have uh, in mind based on the discussion we had in previous meetings. So basically, if people are willing to contribute to this document, uh, of course, we'll share again on the mailing list. Please clearly have a look at this table. Look at the challenge you're interested into um, into participating. Identify yourself as a contributor here in the document, in the beginning of the document and the table, and also propose uh, some content. So here you have detailed instructions at the beginning of the document. So you will have uh, uh, some kind of clear instruction. To be honest, we, we have a use case section in the document, but we do not re uh, request at that time content for this section because uh, we know from previous experience that if you go directly into use case, uh, it will be uh, it will be completely uh, let's say um, uh, separate use cases without really some kind of uh, um, uh, some kind of uh, or to say um, uh, some kind of commonalities between use cases. So here is the goal: you really need to more look into the challenges. Of course, in the goal section, you can provide also some kind of uh, overview of use case, but not detailed use case at that time. It will it will come later in order to have a more synthetic view on the challenges. Uh, it's really uh, our, yeah, our uh, on purpose that we did that. And uh, so, yeah, that, that's basically the document, the current uh, document version. And if you go back to the slide, Laurent, please. So, uh, <clears throat> The slide? No, but I think it may be some some kind of delay. But so, 
then it just on the on the other part of the slide yes so here you have just a summary of the process as i said before uh, if you are willing to contribute just yeah yeah identify yourself in the document also give feedback if you disagree with what you propose in terms of table of contents of course it's not fixed structure it may evolve i think one good uh, one discussion we have also usually is what what is uh, what is a, is a publication target for such a document? Uh, for some discussion, we should say that it should appear kind of uh, as a draft in in the group in order to have some rapid visibility. But at the same point, it's more kind of a white paper, so it should be um, uh, it should be uh, it should be yes, published as white paper or journal or magazine. But it will be long term long term goals. But as many people say that it's interesting to participate to such an initiative, but we will need visibility. It will be good to have this document yes, as a draft as well. So here's a proposition regarding yes, the type of, uh, of way to, to collaborate. We'll start with Google Docs. It's just to facilitate this, the starting of the collaboration. It does not mean that we will continue with Google Docs. For example, if, you, if we want to use the GitHub that uh, Laurent uh, mentioned previously, is that, yeah, yes, we will probably use it, but to be, as most possible, as open at the beginning, we will start with Google Docs, but it's not does not mean that it should be the final final version, the final type of uh, tools that we will use. So here we are really willing for contributors and feedback on the process and the document uh, uh, contents that we would like to have. So if you have yeah any feedback, just tell us now or in mailing this because I know we have a bit short of time now. Uh, maybe I'll just present the full slide and then you can, if somebody has a question, can just raise the hand. Regarding AI, we have in mind also to organize more regular, let's say, series of talk regarding uh, uh, regarding this topic in order to have more technical talk as uh, it was suggested to us as well. Um, so this is really something which is in the preliminary step. It should not be actually, we, we do not expect especially see that as uh, only an energy activities, but we would like to have something uh, more uh, global with other group and communities at a uh, different uh, at, uh, at a different place. But in order to have some kind of recurrent, like uh, every month or every two months to have this kind of uh, 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 series. But it's very preliminary, as, as I said. We have also in mind this um, AI challenges that we, I mean, uh, technical challenges or competition. So here we just uh, we just uh, mentioned two existing one, not an, an energy specific. So one is proposed by ITU, and uh, noting that the registration is open. So if you want to to participate to the challenge as a, as a participant, uh, you can follow this link. Also one which is uh, proposed. Uh, uh, not only by but uh, partially by uh, by the Polytechnic Polytechnic University of, of um, Catalonia about graph neural network. Um, so it was supposed to 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 be open soon, but yeah, you know, with the situation, uh, it's not clear when it will be open, and I don't think we have you know, we don't we don't have Albert here. Regarding an energy, as far as I know, all the unfortunately all the projects are a bit uh, a bit stopped now. Uh, but of course, it's still open. If an energy would like to propose a technical uh, challenges, uh, I mean participant of an energy, so it's still open. But as far as I know, there is no uh, project that is continuing for this last item. So here is a summary of the slide. So if you have any comment question. Do not hesitate. I suggest we, we move on. Yeah, sure. Okay. So next uh, is more a, a status on the internet based networking work plan of the neural research group. So, as you can see, this is the table of milestones we have corresponding to the, what we have in the charter. Uh, I try to map everything in terms of work items with respect to basic milestones when they are adopted and uh, go to the RLG review, uh, the dates and a bit the status. And I uh, just wanted to highlight, okay, it's in red, but it's not uh, critical. Okay, we are not a working group. It, there is no uh, PGPP release or whatever. It's just to highlight the, 
a bit of a critical situation in terms of where we stand with respect to our initial goals. Uh, for these three three items, the other ones are a bit more uh, on track. Uh, so just focusing on the first one, the first work item we had was document the problem statement, design goals and challenges for intent based networking. We initially uh, had these three first work items together as a batch. Uh, we wanted to reach research group adoption by the end of last year. Uh, unfortunately, we have no corresponding documents uh, currently for this uh, specific work item. The initial goal was to describe the problem and solution space, identify the limits of current technologies and methods, and derive the associated research challenges. So it doesn't need to be a very long document, but at least I believe, Jerome and I, we believe that this is an, of utmost importance that this uh, work happens in the research group because it helps us to define clearly what we are trying to solve. Okay, we are already engaged into other documents, but I think uh, these this aspects of the, 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 the program statement the goals are important. I see Alex uh, in the queue, but let me just finish with the, the slide and I take your, your comment. Uh, as possible, next steps. Uh, this is just open proposal. Uh, we, we may refine them, of course. Uh, to come up quickly with a new document uh, to address specifically this uh, this point, or to move part or uh, all this work item uh, to existing documents, for instance, the draft IBM concept and definition, or we can at least uh, in the last resort drop this work item, which I don't uh, encourage us to to do. I would prefer to find alternative. Alex, you wanted to comment on this. Um, yes, yeah, I, I was just wondering, so basically, re, so you say, uh, I, I'm wondering basically, is, is there somebody working on this right now? Or is it just that there's really no, no, no document uh, and basically we're waiting for someone to, to, to create a new one? There is no, um, I would say, individual documents that have been proposed towards the energy. Um, I mean, I'm wor personally, as an individual, I'm working on that. Uh, for Nokia, so we have a draft, uh, not a draft, but a draft document. It's not yet ready to be shared, so we, if we, we could contribute that to, to energy, but we, we have to find the right window to, to do that. And yes, it, it would be nice from a research group perspective to, to have something coming in as new documents or based on something else, but uh, this would be appreciated. Okay. And Thanks. we can collaborate. I mean, it's not necessarily needs to be a one one person or one uh, organization document. Of course, this is completely uh, collaborative by default. Sure. Yeah. I think if there's a need, and I think there's a lot of uh, people who are very motivated to work on on, on stuff here, uh, we we should take it up. So I I hadn't really been aware. So so thanks for pointing this out. Yeah, okay, so it's something we can share also on the uh, on the mailing list or point to point with the people that I'm with. at least raise the call for 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 contributions uh, to the mailing list and see if we have a group of persons interested to quickly uh, move forward with this one. I don't believe it's so complex or difficult. It's just that we have this in our work item and uh, a bit milestones. So if we can achieve that, it would be better for to be consistent with what we have defined in the charter. Thanks. Okay, the second one is still in the uh, work plan for, for internet-based networking, but it's addressing a different part, which I think is the most important one we should um, this, I mean, uh, work on in the research group. Uh, so this is uh, about so-called architecture. So the goal was to determine the elementary functional blocks of an IBM system, their interactions, input and outputs, and propose different techniques applicable for the different functions. Um, we are planning to have something uh, as an early research group adoption for July this year. Uh, currently, we we had previously some individual documents that were addressing this architecture discussion that are expired now. Uh, there have been a few meetings where we have uh, uh, had technical proposal uh, towards uh, this architecture discussion, but currently uh, we don't have active documents and new proposal for that. So I believe it's a very central piece of the IBM workman to be able to to come with this uh, common architectural framework, um, especially in continuation with what we have so currently with the intent classification and, um, and uh, in the concept and definition. 
Possible next steps, again, to come quickly with uh, new documents or reactivate expired documents to uh, really uh, respin this activity. And I think really not, I think beyond this starting, the restarting of this activity, we should really increase considerably the level of activity in the research group on this item, because this is a big piece of work. Uh, we don't go into a formal specification, but at least this reference model will be very useful in order to help uh, different pieces of the solutions to, to come together. We have seen that, for instance, Benoit with his work in OPS. There are other works also in OPS that are of, of interest. In Anima, there have been also some, some, some calls in the past. I think there are many groups and expectation. And if we can contribute with something that helps to, to reach this common uh, architecture of view, it will be very helpful. Uh, the next one, uh, okay, sorry. Next one is uh, item five. Um, this one is more uh, on so-called use cases or validation scenarios. It's a bit the same situation. We wanted to uh, go towards um, having uh, some preliminary results and, and, and documents uh, end of, of last year. This was okay, we, we had this, but we don't have the corresponding documents. We had a, some proof of concept demonstration in, in October last year. But from, it's important from a validation point of view. And so potential next steps to come again with uh, documents like use case documents, experimental or implementation um, description that could show how uh, to um, concrete application of, of our ID and concepts uh, in, in real settings. Also improve the links with implementation and proof of concept. This is the item six in the work plan. Um, so, as I say, we have some proof of concept demos and tools that are being developed, but we need to have the corresponding description of those uh, of those experiments uh, to be able to progress on, on our work plan. And again, the level of activity in that space uh, should, should also increase. Louis, you had comments? I don't know if it's on this one or the previous one. This one, uh, Laurent. Uh, yeah, my, my comment is that uh, I, I, I wonder if the transport uh, intent that I presented could be considered as a use case for this. I think that uh, from my point of view, yes. I would like to know what is your perspective. Could, could you hear me? Yeah, sorry, Luis. I, I say it was a bit uh, difficult for me to hear you. Can you repeat the last sentence, please? Yeah, sure. So uh, I, I was basically considering that uh, probably that the transparent slice uh, slicing could be a huge case for the, for this. So I would like just to to know your opinion on that. Yeah, uh, this is a very good point because uh, when I was reviewing a bit the content for this meeting, I thought that uh, the work that you are proposing um, with the transport uh, um, slice intent and also the, the thing you proposed before that are actually could be really related to that. Uh, we can have um, a use case around transport slice or a kind of use network provider plus vertical interactions for for uh, for intense instantiation. This could be a way to, to see a kind of experiments or use case with concrete um, boundaries to that. And I know also that uh, you're also on this number five, also um, working on um, uh, corresponding, uh, I mean, uh, test beds and proof of concept. So I, I believe if you have willingness to contribute, this could be a good starting point, yes. Uh, for sure, and uh, and also if we could link with the IPF activity in the peace working group. I, I think that we could have a, a very nice story on this. So okay, thank you. Yeah, okay, we can interact further to see a bit the positioning of of your draft in in an emoji. Okay, thank you. Next, okay, let me go back to this. So finally, uh, for uh, last update on intent-based networking work, uh, work plan, we. Also, had in mind to, I mean, we have this hackathon project. We wanted to contribute with a bit more practical aspects of, of IDN. Uh, what we are going to do is to consult with uh, the different involved teams that uh, we managed to, to contact, that uh, we know have plans in that space, uh, interact with them to define pr a proper scope and objectives of what we would like to achieve with such a kind of hackathon project. Uh, and so an overall planning when we think we can be ready uh, with respect to the objective and align with the research group milestone. We 
Initially, I had in mind to uh, a target participation in the next IETF meeting in July in Madrid. Uh, there are still some uncertainty uh, from the meeting point of view, if it will be in person and what will be the ability of people to travel or to participate on site or remotely. So this is very open and uncertain. So we have to reassess uh, the practicality of uh, targeting something concrete uh, for July. It doesn't mean that we will not work, but uh, we have to understand if it will be a bit more uh, different themes, different setting. We have to see what will be what will make most sense. Uh, and also for, for the future, maybe more at the uh, end of the year. So we will communicate towards the research group uh, with um, uh, a bit this, this framework that we would like to, to, to pursue so that everyone can be aware and can uh, express interest and, and willingness to contribute. And of course, if you have any um, um, willingness to support and help us in this, uh, we are really uh, welcoming uh, and, and brains. Last point in the uh, technical uh, update for the research group. Uh, we have a third, third uh, research activity, which is more towards the self-driving, self-management frameworks. So our idea, so this is just to host a form of discussion to, to, to see a bit what's going on and how it can influence uh, further developments of uh, internet management and operations. What we observe a bit was that we, we could organize a kind of dedicated session uh, based on what we have seen recently inputs coming from different groups, especially the Ops Area Working Group, where we have seen this ECA uh, framework for self-management or um, uh, work from automating service and network management framework, service assurance for IBM architecture that was presented at this meeting by Benoit. So there are already in Ops several works that are touching architecture, closely automation, uh, policy-based management, uh, automation, so all of uh, correlated items that have been uh, progressed by different um, organizations, different groups of persons. Uh, in Anima Working Group, there are also uh, this reference model and ACP that are finally will be able to, to move forward. So this can be also a way to reconnect with uh, some architectural work that was uh, pursued in Anima. There may be also other working groups. This is not exhaustive. Uh, there have been also uh, more recently uh, some publication of uh, specification architectures in other uh, SDOs such as HCZSM or uh, ENI. Uh, we can also uh, invite them to participate and of course try to see also from other uh, we'll say research or uh, even uh, less researchy academic and industry initiative on network management architecture. So try to bring together these different initiatives and, and, and proposal and see um, uh, commonalities, uh, trends that are emerging and make people discuss together. We could have this for the next IETF 108, maybe the one after, if it's more relevant in terms of organization, dedicated virtual meetings. We have to, to we are really open to, 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 to the best option and we are welcoming your opinions on that. Okay, so I'm just continuing because we're already quite over time. Uh, finally, just a very uh, quick view on uh, the future meetings. So, Next week, we should have had a um, in-person in inter-meeting in Budapest for the IEEE NOMS conference, but the NOMS conference will be fully virtual this year. <coughs> so we decided to cancel the uh, special session on, on uh, energy because the idea was more to, to meet people and, uh, and gather with the, the, the different communities. Um, but NOMS is maintained, it will be a virtual conference, so you can still register and attend this very good program that will be uh, next week. All the keynotes, all the technical speeches. Uh, we had also planned a um, special session, a dedicated meeting with the IPOP conference in uh, Tokyo, but uh, again, this conference is, has been moved to uh, September this year. Uh, so we currently have to cancel our plan for that. And September was not uh, a good uh, slot uh, to have an energy participation due to uh, absence of the chairs. So we decided to uh, cancel our participation for the moment. We may investigate uh, for participating maybe next year again. We have a meeting in July in Madrid, which is currently maintained, even if it, uh, there are plans to consider face-to-face -face or virtual uh, meetings. But we have there, if we met um, some targets in terms of Akaton and several research group milestones, so this will be an important um, time of the year for us. 
The main message for the future meetings here is that we want to say until further notice, the default mode of operation will increasingly rely on mostly virtual meetings. We have already done that for a few times now, so it's uh, we are quite um, used to it. Uh, we want to use more the mailing list to have our technical discussion and also uh, rely also on collaborative platforms as you have seen, for instance, uh, with uh, the, the document that Jerome highlighted uh, for with Google Docs, if it's accessible for people or for different drafts and activities. And of course, do not hesitate to share your questions, ideas or needs uh, with the entire group or the chairs. We know that it may be difficult for some of us uh, to reorganize uh, since we are not meeting face to face for uh, Alex, you wanted to raise something before? I saw you withdrawn, but maybe you still want to share. Oh, no. So I, uh, I just wanted to mention that this is a misleading, right? NOMS uh, has been cancelled. It's the meeting that has been cancelled. So NOMS is virtual. Exactly, yes. Yeah. The IEEE NOMS conference will not be an in person conference. It will be mentioned virtually. It's next week. There are a lot of talks that are scheduled. But the energy participation to NOMS uh, is cancelled. <clears throat> That's it for research group updates. Jerome, I don't know if you want to add something. <coughs> oh, no, 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 nothing else, uh, Laura. I think uh, you said everything regarding the updates. Oh. So, uh, on my side, I would like to thank a lot all the participants. Uh, it was challenging to have this very long meeting, um, especially because we are covering a very diverse time zone. So, thank you for all the ones that had to stay up very late or <laughs> wake up very early. Uh, it's always a challenge from our perspective to find the right slot. But thank you for your very good technical presentation, very good interactions uh, also through the chat. I hope we will get very good minutes and able to continue. I've seen a lot of new inputs, very good uh, technical discussion that are a lot of potential. So I will to progress. And again, it's uh, contribution driven, as we say. So please um, continue working like this. Thank you very much. Have a nice whatever part of the day you have left. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, no. Thank you, bye-bye.